this is, I'm Gary Gillette, president of the Southern Michigan chapter. I see a lot of old friends here, Alan Anthony, haven't seen in a while. Hey, Alan, Francis Kinlaw, Lawrence Cat, Larry, I should say, Mitch Lutzke, who is our membership director, uh, Jerry and a child, um, and uh, Stu Shea, okay. and, and we have, uh, are honored to have our first Hall of Famer at any of our uh, Sabre meetings here, uh, Jim Cott. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to um, hang on for a few minutes um, before I let Dan introduce um, our guest. I'll tell you there's a trivia quiz, significant quiz, as Francis was grilling me about, um, being posted on line and um when rogelio castillo joins he's gonna uh put the link in the chat there are two versions one with answers one without answers you're on the honor system although i'd love to get a ruler and smack your knuckles if you cheat i can't do it so um and as i said it's really designed to be amusing and a little bit educational and not to be the standard uh kind of questions about a hall of famer that people ask um there's Rogelio now so we're going to have um Jim Cott here in a few minutes and then he's going to go for an hour hopefully if he doesn't fall over um in boredom or terror from our questions I think not I think he's probably capable of handling a group of ruffians like us and then we're going to have a break and then we're going to have a panel on Miguel Cabrera's career with um, two Tigers beat writers, Cody Stavenham at The Athletic, who is a recent arrival in town, maybe five, six years, and Jason Beck of MLB.com, who has covered all of Cabrera's career here and is the longest serving beat writer now. He's been here since 2002. And also Rogelio Castillo. Uh, I'm looking forward to that very much. And so, Let's go. Um, welcome. If you just joined, uh, we're going to start off here in a few minutes. Then we have uh, Jim Cott for an hour. Uh, Dan Diodano will be the interviewer and moderator. Then we'll take a break. Then we have an hour panel discussion of Miguel Cabrera's career. There's a trivia quiz that's been posted. Um, uh, Rogelio is going to post the link to that in the chat. Uh, there he goes. He just posted it now. And you're welcome to um, to look at that at any point. We'll discuss that after the panel discussion. And coffee there, sweetie. I will. Um, and I think that's it. We'll have a little bit of chapter visit at the end. Mostly, I'm going to ask people about what they uh, are interested in doing this year. I have very good news that Jason Benetti, the Tigers' new um, uh, TV broadcaster has agreed to uh, appear at one of our meetings around opening day. I haven't scheduled it yet. My thinking will be a Zoom meeting because it makes it easier for him to do it when he's on the road and we have more flexibility. Um, and of course, there's no guarantee what the weather would be like if we do an in-person meeting. And if it goes well, then maybe we'll try to do an in-person meeting with him later. Uh, Jason spoke at the Sabre convention at the Palmer House Chicago last July. He was really good. I mean, you would expect him to be good from listening to his broadcast, but he was really good. And I cannot believe the White Sox were so foolish as to let him go. Actually, I can believe they're the White Sox, right? <laughs> good friend of mine, Matt Silverman, one of the experts on the Mets. Uh, I met him working on Total Baseball decades ago. Matt said one time when I asked him a question uh, about the Mets, like why the Mets did this, because I was scratching my head and couldn't figure it out. And he said, well, that falls into the large category of questions, which the answer is because Mets. That's the only answer there is. So because White Sox, I guess. Okay. Um, let me see. I want to see if I want to acknowledge anybody else. Um, as I said, I see some new faces here or new names, and I'm very grateful for that, uh, as well as for our veterans. Tom Bibluski has joined. Um and uh, we need new people and new ideas. So if, you're, if you've been bad to your kids or your spouse, or if you were a bad person in a previous life and you want to do penal servitude, you can volunteer to help out our chapter. I guarantee it won't be that painful. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know how bad you were in a previous life, so maybe it would be. Okay. All right. Uh, Tell, uh, 
two o'clock. Dan, I'm going to say a couple of words here and then let you take it over. I think we'll start a little bit early since we've got a nice group here and I've run out of things to say, clever or not. I just want to say that I've been in baseball now almost 40 years, not as long as Jim Cott, but long enough to have lots of gray hair and heard lots of stuff. And he is one of the very few people I could say, I would count on the fingers of two hands, along with Raleigh Hemond, who uh, passed last year, that I've never heard a bad word about. And people in baseball can be vicious and certainly they're highly competitive and critical. I've never heard anyone say anything bad about Jim Cott. In fact, while I don't live in Minnesota and don't live in New York, I'd say it's a safe bet that he is very well liked, if not beloved in both places, in Minnesota as a player and in New York as a broadcaster. If anyone else wants to chime in on that, if you disagree, you can step outside after the meeting. <laughs> and we are honored to have a Hall of Famer here and a Michigan native, one of the few ball players who doesn't flee to the sun, sun-soaked uh, southern states or western states and abandon our gray and, and cold Michigan. And I am very impressed that he's still uh, loyal to our, our uh, state. Anyway, Dan, you can take it away. All right. Thanks, Gary. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan Diodon. I'm the sports editor at the Holland Sentinel, uh, and I've been a Sabre member for quite some time now. Um, used to be the the young pup in the Sabre room, and as you can see by the gray in my beard, that is no longer the case. Um, but I've been uh, at the Holland Sentinel for 20 years now, and that means I've known Jim Cott for almost 20 years. Uh, he is from Zeeland, Michigan, which is just outside of Holland, and um, we are very grateful to have uh, have him here. He's a 16-time uh, Gold Glove winner and 208, won 283 games, and uh, you know, and made the Hall of Fame uh, in 2022 um, after one of the longer waits. Uh, we're very glad that he's a Hall of Famer and one of uh, six Hall of Famers from Michigan. So not very many, not very many there. So. Uh, Jim, welcome. Uh, welcome. Good to talk to you again. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, how this is going to work is I have some questions that I'm going to ask Jim. And then if you guys, uh, have questions that you'd like to see, uh, just throw them in the chat. And if we have time to get to them at the end, we will definitely do that. So, um, Jim, how you doing? Doing fine, Dan. Always good to, uh, talk with people that love baseball you know it this is the group this is the group um any chance we get your video on uh let's see i'll have i thought i thought we had it on but i'll i don't know what i have to hit margie's right here so she'll hey margie how you doing i'm doing fine so there we go start video allow camera how's that there we go Hey, okay. Jim, there we go. Perfect. I'm security. Can you enlarge that at all or not? You might just have to get it a little closer. There we go. No, it's just in third. It's just in a third of the screen. Yeah. That's all good. Okay. All good? Okay. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it looks Keep good. It right there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank thanks again for joining us, Jim. Um, you know, always a pleasure. This is a this is a good group. Uh to uh talk baseball with so um yeah i wanted to get right to it i mean uh you've had a very very long career lots of great moments but i wanted to start more recently i mean obviously a huge deal making uh making the hall of fame uh how has that how has that changed uh changed things for you well i think dan you know from being uh at the hall of fame working there you know the magnitude uh, being a baseball Hall of Famer just seems to carry uh, – it, it creates so much more attention. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got friends in the other Halls of Fame. I talked to my friend Bar Bill Parcells, who's an avid baseball fan, but there's something about the National Baseball Hall of Fame that has uh, cachet, you know, it just uh, – and, and that's what really – I don't know if it surprised me because, you know, I haven't thrown a pitch in 40 years, but, uh, but when, uh, when all of a sudden they find out you are a baseball hall of famer, it creates uh, a lot of attention, probably more so than I thought it would. Gotcha. 
Well, and you're one of just very few from Michigan. I mean, we've got Ted Simmons and Kai Kai Kyler and Smoltz uh, and Charlie Geringer yeah. and and Newhauser. That's a that's a very select group. What what does that part of it mean to you to represent your state? Well, I think that uh, other than hearing the name Kai Kai Kyler, I uh, I think I probably crossed paths with the rest of them and. Right. And uh, when my dad took me to my first games at uh, Briggs Stadium, June 26, 1946, Hal Newhauser was the winning pitcher in the first game. I was a doubleheader. He also hit a home run. Awesome. Uh, and, and that's, of course, when he was a back-to-back -back MVP, which a lot of, uh, I don't know if I'd say cynics, but they thought, well, the, the competition wasn't as strong then because there was a lot of people off in the war. But uh, – uh, he certainly, he was not my boyhood hero. That was Bobby Shantz, but I certainly followed the career of Hal Newhauser. And of course I know Smoltzy and Teddy Simmons, who was a teammate briefly in St. Louis. So it's, uh, nice to be a part of that crowd. For sure. It's been a big few years. I mean, since Smoltz, you had you and you and Ted have joined that group. And I mean, it, we can kind of count Jeter too. I know he was born in New Jersey, but he grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah, um, really that's, a, it's there. a good group. Oops, I lost it. You're good. Uh, am I okay? Yep, yeah, you're good. Oh, okay. I thought I lost it. I lost the screen here. It's all good. So, so um, let's let's go back to you know when you were starting. I mean, uh, baseball was very different when you were growing up in Zeeland, Michigan. In Zeeland, Michigan, uh, a lot of times seems uh, that's even changed and gotten quite a bit bigger. Um, than, than it was when you were growing up but what was what was amateur baseball like in Michigan when you were when you were growing up well every little town had a town team as far as participation uh fast pitch softball was more the game and I maybe that's why my arm held up well as I pitched a lot of fast pitch softball as a kid and my dad was the official scorer at Legion Field there were all these little country towns had a softball team and they play three games a night, you know, uh, six, seven and eight or something like that. But as far as the baseball, uh, our town team was the Zealand chicks and they had a team in South Haven, Fenville, Holland. Uh, we play the house of David, the Grand Rapids black Sox. And I was a kid, I was a bat boy. So uh, that was the amateur baseball there that uh, they played one game a week. And uh, I enjoyed being a bat boy. Then when I was 16, uh, the manager said, kid, how'd you like to pitch for us next year? And so I uh, said to my dad, Scaly, it was Marina Scaly was a manager. I said, he, he wants me to pitch for the chicks. He said, well, you've done everything you could in Legion ball. That was kind of my first uh, amateur ball. So there I was at uh, 16 and 17, you know, pitching for the town team. We'd go play Fenville. And then after the game, they'd stop at the old crow for a cold beer. And then they would bring uh bring a soda pop up to me where I had to sit in the car because I couldn't go in with them. So that was a big deal for me. I mean, these guys were old veterans for me. They were 23 years old. Some of them played in the minor league. So that was a, a pretty memorable time for me. For sure. And then you ended up pitching at Hope College. Take us through. I mean, that's in, in Holland, Michigan, for those that don't know. Um, just what what brought you to Hope? Well, Western Michigan was the attractive baseball school. Uh, Charlie Marr was a longtime coach there. It's before it was Western Michigan uh, University. Jim Boughton went there, Frank Quillacy. And so that was the place to go for baseball. And uh, I kind of had my, uh, my mind on going there. But, uh, you know, then Hope College didn't offer scholarships, but they would give you a job in the summer. So uh, the more I thought about it, uh, and then I I'd met with Russ DeVette, the coach. And the thing was, if I went to Hope, I knew I was going to pitch. Our college schedule then was 12 games, uh, six doubleheaders. My roommate pitched six, I pitched six, seven inning games. So I knew there I was going to get a chance to pitch. And, uh, and it was, you know, close to home. So that's why I opted to go to Hope. And your roommate was from very near Cooperstown. Uh, right. And he, he gave you your first taste of uh, of the Hall of Fame, right? 
Yes, he did. When I went back on Thanksgiving vacation, uh, Al was from Herkimer, New York, Al Kober. And that's when I toured the Hall of Fame. I still have a copy of the uh, the postcard that I sent my parents in uh, in 1956, I guess that was. My dad actually went to the Lefty Groves Hall of Fame production in 1947, so I knew all about the Hall of Fame. But then, then Al was, he was very excited. He came to my number retirement in uh, in, in Minnesota, and he also came to the uh, induction in, in uh, Cooperstown. So it was good to, to hook up with him again uh, af after all those years from being freshman at Hope College. For sure, for sure. And uh, what um, – take me through now, you know, from Hope College to a professional. Uh, how did that – how did that go, and how did you uh, – how did you end up with Washington? Well, uh, Dick Winsick – it's funny, I – at the Alabama baseball coaches in uh, Montgomery a couple nights ago, and there was a well-known scout there, Joe Mason, and he knew of Dick Winsick. And that's when scouts were a huge part of the game. Unfortunately, uh, baseball has changed that, and not for the better, because the scouts, you know, were, were the lifeblood of the game, kicking the bushes and trying to find talent. So Dick Winsick was actually going to Kalamazoo to see the lefty that pitched for them. I can't recall his name, but. Uh, I had a good, I had a good game. He, I'm sure it's sort of a legendary fictional tale, but he said it was a, <laughs> a dusty afternoon and one of my warm up pitches came back and hit one of the boards on the screen and it kind of woke him up a little bit. So he said, I better watch this kid. And then the next week we played Alma and we traveled in station wagons. So our coach was Russ Devet. And on the way back from Alma, where I had a, another good game, actually I pitched seven, I pitched six games, seven innings in all the games, and I gave up one run. And if I went to a tryout camp, I'd get turned down because I wasn't really a hard thrower. But anyway, Russ DeVet said, well, I heard there's a scout in the stands today. I don't know who he was watching. Now, I didn't know if he was pulling my leg, but I'm thinking to myself, well, I hope he was watching me. And uh, the next week, sure enough, he called, uh, tracked down my dad and said, we'd like to invite Jim to come down and try out with the Washington Senators in Comiskey Park. Uh, so that's kind of where I, I got my start. I went down, tried out, and uh, threw on the sideline. Cookie Lavagetto, the manager, said, kid, you sign with us. Uh, you'll be on my staff in two two years. And I told my dad on the way home. And, and of course, my dad was the kind that would kind of temper things down. And he said, well, Jim, you know, he might say that to a lot of young pitchers. So, right. but anyway, that's, that's kind of, I, I signed in a, a quick story about how influential uh, and unusual decision that my dad made, which I doubt would happen today. But those of you that are are on the on the screen on the chat here, uh, you, you probably know that in 1957, if you got more than a four thousand dollar bonus, uh, you had to sit on the you had to be on the major league roster, the active roster, for two years. Right. That uh, that delayed the career of Sandy Koufax, Harmon Killebrew. Uh, some of them didn't even make it back for it, never made it for it. They got big money up front. I remember the Tigers had a, a player named Jimmy Small back in the – and he was one that got big money, never turned out to be that good. So my dad studied that. So when Washington offered me four to take that and go to Superior, Nebraska, Pete Melito from Grand Rapids, who was a White Sox scout, called and said to my dad, I think we can get your son – $25,000. Well, my dad made 72 bucks a week in 1957. So later on, I began to add up the math and realize what a decision he made because he said, Pete, thank you, but Jim's going to go to the lowest miners and learn his craft. So he turned down the 25 and lo and behold, I did get called up about uh, a month after my two years at Cookie said I would be on the staff. It took me a little, little while longer than that to stick, but uh, that's kind of my how my signing unfolded. For sure, very, very interesting. Very uh, anybody that knows Zeeland, Michigan, would not be surprised at how your how your dad handled that. Uh, that was, uh, it, and it worked out pretty well. Um, what What do you remember about your major league debut? Where Where was it? Who were you playing? Well, here's what was interesting. Uh, you know, I was in Chattanooga, 1959, double A ball. 
And uh, I had come off a big year in Missoula. I, at the time, I, I kind of filled out, and I was a, a strikeout pitcher. I just struck out 19, which set the Southern Association record. I think Jim Maloney broke it after that, uh, Cincinnati pitcher. And then I struck out the first four the next game, and then I, I felt something in my shoulder. We didn't have x-rays, MRIs. And uh, so I came out of that game, and uh, – Red Mary and the manager said, well, just take 10 days off. So actually, I, I flew back to to uh, Zealand by way of Grand Rapids, of course, and uh, spent 10 days at home. We didn't have rehab programs. And so then I came back and it was activated. And when I when I began to pitch again, my arm angle had dropped down to about three quarter because of whatever it was in my shoulder. So now August 1, Red Mary and the manager calls me in and said, uh, kid you're going to the big leagues and I said red do, do they know what's going on in my arm he said get up there and tell them about it can you imagine that <laughs> happening today? that would never happen today <laughs> they, they count every time you breathe today so right I get up there and I start against the White Sox game two of a double header I think we were in the process of an 18 game losing streak and uh, Russ Kimmerer pitched the first game and lost two to one. And so I'm up in that little cubby hole of a clubhouse above the third base dugout in Comiskey Park. And now I'm on my way walking down the stairs to warm up for game two. And they're coming up and Russ looked at me. It was just out of frustration. He said, kid, good luck. You don't have a chance. You know, because <laughs> we, we just didn't beat anybody. And, and he was right because in about the, uh, the first guy I faced was Louis Aparicio. I think I may have retired him in order the first inning, and then it fell apart. But uh, after I came out, maybe in the third or fourth, the, the uh, pitching coach, Walter Beck, he said, what happened to you? You're not the same. I said, no, I, I did something to my shoulder. So uh, immediately was, uh, I don't know if they called it the disabled list then, but about uh, two weeks after that, I had a little surgery. They took a sort of a fatty tumor out of my back, which was altering my delivery. So it was not a very auspicious debut. And uh, that uh, kept me on the shelf for like 60 days. And then I did get some action uh, the last uh, the last part of the last weekend of the <clears throat> season and, uh, and got a chance actually to face Ted Williams in Boston. Very, very cool. Um, then Washington... Obviously moved to Minnesota. Uh, you guys ended up with a really, really great team uh, with Harmon and Tony Oliva, and then later Rod Carew, and just a lot of, a lot of great players. What, what are your biggest memories from that that group? I mean, that group stayed. A lot of you, you guys stayed together for a while, and you guys were really one one of the better teams. Um, what was that like? Yeah, I think through the '60s, you know, we we only won the one pennant, but we had the d- division and. In- Nine, he may have had the best overall record, at least close to that. But, uh, you know, we had a scout named Papa Joe Cambria, and he scouted the players in Cuba. So we come to Minnesota being, you know, the last place team in the American League. But now we have Zoyla Versailles and Tony Oliva. We had a, a couple of other uh, lesser known Cuban players behind the scenes. In fact, it's kind of a funny story when the logo on our caps at TC for Twin Cities, uh, the fans around the league were not familiar with the Twins. So they'd say, what's TC stand for? And I would always tell them 20 Cubans because <laughs> we had Julio Becker, Ramos, <laughs> Pascal, Saez, Oliva, Valdivioso, on and on. We, and Papa Joe discovered all of them. And they that was a wealth of talent. So uh, with Zoilo and Tony, and uh, I matured as a pitcher all of a sudden in uh, 1965, and we we end up winning uh, winning the pennant and breaking the Yankees uh, streak at five in a row that they'd won. And and just the personalities, I mean, you between you and Tony and Harmon and Rod and a, a just a mo- a most of the guys on the team, like very very good people too, very well liked, very it's very easy to get along with. How how much did that part in the clubhouse help you guys? Well, Harmon Harmon was the face of our franchise, and Harmon was such a gentleman. He was a gentleman to a fault, 
because I told him, you know, Harm would say to me, we, we played, if you followed the game, we played for a very tight-fisted owner. And every year it was an argument to get some kind of a raise or a kind, and, and he would say, Jim, if you'd be a little nicer to Mr. Griffith, he'll take care of you when, when your career's over. I said, Harm, when you can't hit the ball over the wall, they won't know how to spell your name. <laughs> and he didn't see it as a business yet, but he was such a gentleman. Later he admitted, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think his his demeanor, the way he carried himself, the way he behaved on and off the field was a big influence on all of us. To this day, if you see a Minnesota twin that was under the har uh, influence of Harmon Killebrew, they will write their name so you can read it. Mm -hmm. Michael Dyer, for example, has impeccable penmanship. And Harmon always would say to the young players, when he'd say, is that your name? Don't you want to sign it so somebody knows who you are? So he even had a big influence on the Twins after his playing days were over. But I think we all looked up to, to Harmon and respected the fact that uh, he could control his emotions. And I think our, our whole team kind of represented that type of personality. For sure. And then you guys were in the 65 World Series against the Dodgers. Uh, you got to pitch against Sandy Koufax a couple of times. Just what was, I mean, it's still decently early in your career, you know, facing, you know, arguably, you know, arguably the best left-hander ever, at least during that stretch. Right. What, what was that like for you? And you pitched very well against him too. Well, I, I did in uh, that, that first game, the, the, seventh game we can get to that but you know in those days Pee Wee and Diz were on TV on Saturdays and we were playing also so I never saw Sandy pitch in person and so I'll give you a quick aside story you know he didn't pitch game one because of the Jewish holiday Yom Kippur mm -hmm. so Drysdale did so we knocked Drysdale out I think it was the fourth inning we, we knocked him around pretty good and when Alston came out to get the ball uh, Drysdale gave him the ball, looked at him and said, I bet you wish I was Jewish, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, I'm warming up in the bullpen and Sandy, the, the, the bullpen mounds are about, you know, 20 feet apart, 30 feet apart. And this guy is just, the ball's coming out of his hand. You know, I'd never heard or seen anything like that. Cold gray day. And he looked over, he said, you guys play in this weather? I thought, well, that's, <laughs> that's the best chance we have because, you know, we, we played the snow flurry sometime. So we go through uh, we go through the lineup the first time. I think I I think we each walked a man, but it's pretty well one, two, three, one, two, three. And I said to Johnny Sane, I sat down next to him at the uh, in the dugout, I said, John, if I give up a run, this game's over. I said, Nobody can hit this guy. And we scratched out one uh, one earned run off him, and Drysdale actually pinch hit for him in the seventh inning. And we ended up uh, winning that game five to one. Then he shut us out in game five and he shut us out in game seven on two days rest, striking out 10 without a curveball. And uh, 24 innings, he gave up one run. I'm so honored that I became a friend, friends with Sandy and, and he went out of his way to come to my induction two years ago. Uh, he was a little fearful of the, uh, you know, the, the COVID issue. Uh, he just turned 88. Uh, back the first part of the year but uh it, it's been a real treat to get to know him as a as a person but uh facing him in that world series was uh was a pretty awesome experience and then in game i mean game seven like was did you feel different how did the atmosphere feel different even from the other games well you know it's game seven but i, I think Johnny Sane psychologically was so good for all of us because, you know, it's kind of the thing. Nobody expects you to outpitch Sandy Koufax. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't, I didn't feel any extra pressure. I think I, I believe, I wish I did because I think at that time we were so happy just to be in the world series, but I don't think we had the same intensity. I, I used that to my advantage 17 years later when I got in the world series with the Cardinals but the game seven of the 65 World Series, I gave up two runs on three consecutive pitches that took probably a total of two minutes. So they could have quit. They could have stopped the game right there. Could have been over because we, we couldn't touch it. So Lou Johnson hooked 
a ball off the foul pole in left run number one. Ron Fairley hit a double. And then the next pitch, Wes Parker, to his credit, trying to hit it to right field, advanced the runner, and he dinked it a little single. Now it's two to nothing. And Sam Mealy came out and said, well, you know, he didn't want to do it, but he said, I, I got to treat this like it's the ninth inning of the game. So we went right to the bullpen, and I couldn't blame it. Uh, so that was the game. Three pitches, two runs, and uh, it, it just kept the – not that the Minnesota crowd like they are now in, in with the Metrodome and even in today's game – they're much more enthusiastic. Uh, I think the, the fans then came to the game to sit and relax, see what happens. They weren't over emotional. And for a game seven of the World Series, that was probably the quietest crowd you could imagine because we didn't do anything to create any excitement. For sure. And then you, like you, you alluded to the Cardinals, 1982, um, you, you know, you kind of, you know, you'd mentioned to me before you kind of were looking for that spot to win a World Series. You pitched over 20 years in the big leagues. Uh, what what was that like to finally to finally achieve that with the Cardinals? Yeah, that was a gift. I mean, that was, it just couldn't have been scripted any better. I I didn't realize these things obviously until after it was over. But the you know I was watching the '97 American League Championship Series with Cleveland and Baltimore. And my friend Tim McCarver was doing the game, and he said, well, if the Orioles win, uh, Cal Ripken will go back to uh, the World Series for the first time since 1983, 14 years. Who holds the record for the longest period of time between World Series appearances? So I scratched my head, and I looked at my wife. I said, I think I'm the answer to that question. <laughs> and I was, 17 years. And then um, when we won in 1982, I found out later, uh, Ray Bork, who I know was a, was a hockey player, uh, he had waited 22 years, but but getting my championship ring after 24 seasons was the longest that any uh, player had to wait in any of the major sports to get their championship ring. So that's what being a member of the 1982 Cardinals meant to me. I, I remember when the we had two out in the ninth. Bruce Souter was facing Gorman Thomas, and the police came down around the, the perimeter of the warning track and said, if you guys want to go to the dugout, I said, no, I'm not moving. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not superstitious, but the game's not over till you get 27 outs. So I, uh, uh, so I just sat there until Bruce struck out Gorman Thomas, and then, uh, you know, the celebration started. But that, that definitely was uh, – was a highlight for me being able in my last full year to, to get a world series ring. For sure. And then you, you had, you know, with the twins, you were, you know, you had a, you were in the low offense kind of era. Baseball changed quite a bit. By the time you got to the Cardinals, you've got AstroTurf. You're on a team with Ozzy Smith and Willie McGee and, the, and they're running and it's a, you know, a kind of a different thing. Talk a little bit about, you know, the, how baseball changed just during your playing career. Well, yeah, in the in the '60s, of course, the American League for a long time dominated the, uh, you know, the All Star games, and the Yankees seemed to, you know, be winning a lot of World Series. Uh, so we were sort of a slugging league, and then the National League began to sign all the the star black players, you know, right after Jackie, um, you know, here along came uh, Lou Brock and Maury Wills, and the you know the Dodgers with Jim Gilliam and. And so they had the black stars and their all their game was pitching and speed. And that's why when, when the, uh, the, the American league wanted the national league to go to a designated hitter, they said, no, we like our league the way it is. So the, which was kind <clears> of <throat> that two leagues have to play with different sets of rules, but that's why we, we had the designated hitter because we were not really a fast paced, uh, exciting league. But the Cardinals in 82, that's probably the last team that really played baseball like they did in the 50s and 60s. Because we hit 67 home runs as a team. We stole 200 bases. Whitey Herzog would stay before the game or in the dugout and say, okay, boys, get me 10 singles. And uh, Willie McGee would get on first, and next thing you know, he's on third. Uh, you know, everybody with that astroturf hit the ball on the ground. Now everybody wants to either strike out or launch it in the air, try to hit a home run. 
and, and that was so satisfying to see uh, a team like that. Montreal, I think, had better personnel when they had Carter and Valentine, Dawson, Jimmy Raines, uh, the Phillies, and I had played on the Phillies, Ed Schmitty and Greg Lazinski and Steve Carlton. They, you know, and I don't think they really thought we had a chance to win, but we we didn't make mistakes. We had a great defense at Ozzy at short, and then we had Bruce Souter at the end of the game. So that was probably as enjoyable a baseball season and a team to be a part of that I could ever wish for. All right, and then you we've talked before about uh, you know <clears throat> playing playing for so long and just you know some of the the guys you got to play with and play against. You you'd mentioned before. Uh, that Al Kaline was the toughest hitter, right? That you faced, uh, at least that you faced a lot. Uh, just what was what were the matchups like with him? Well, I, I faced uh, the four guys I faced more than any. I think I helped them all get to the Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, Louis Aparicio, and then Brooks Robinson. I faced Brooks more than any other hitter in my career, and he got more <laughs> hits off me than any other hitter in my career. I spoke at his memorial service. And, I said, you know, Brooks didn't do the damage that Al Kaline did, but I said, if you wanted, and, and Jim Palmer had always said this too, if the winning run was on second to ninth inning and you wanted to single up the middle, Brooks Robinson was your guy. But Al, uh, he was such a nice guy, and we we talked later when we were both announcing games, but uh, I always, I kidded him. I said, when I came out of the Sheraton Cadillac in Detroit, my day to pitch, I knew there'd be a limousine there because you were going to make sure uh, I got to the Brink Stadium safe and sound so you could get your four at bats, you know. <laughs> but he had a lot of 10 home runs, and he was one of those guys. It's hard for a left-hand pitcher to push a right-hand hitter off the plate anyway. You do that more to left-hand hitters. And he just had such aggressive swings against me, and uh, he was just one of those guys. It wasn't like he was, a, uh, you know, an average hitter that did well against me. He was a great hitter, great all-around ball player. And what would you say, I mean, pitching that long, especially after what you dealt with with your arm early on, how were you able to stay in the big leagues for so for so long? Well, I think as, as everybody that follows real baseball knows that if you're left-handed and you can throw strikes, there's usually a team that wants you. But uh, I think there was a saying we had, when I was like, say about 20 and I'd heard it that say, you know, you never really learn how to pitch till you suffer an arm injury. And we didn't have the alternative surgeries that nowadays we got 15 year old kids and their parents take them in and say, let's get Tommy John surgery because you're going to be better after than you were before. Well, we didn't have that, that thing. So what, what, uh, what you learn to do if you had a little arm injury is you had to learn to pitch a different way. And so I was fortunate to have coaches like Eddie Lopat and Johnny Sane, and they taught me how to pitch, the art of pitching, not throwing. And so to be able to do that as a young pitcher, and then, you know, every year it was a year of adjustments. And, uh, you know, I just, I just treated it that way that every year I was a, I was a rookie going to camp. I had to make the team and, uh, and I, I think I was fortunate. I did have an arm injury in 67, but for the most part, um, I didn't have a lot of serious arm injuries. I think that was helpful growing up in a in an area like Michigan where you don't play, you know, 50, 60 games a year. And even these young kids don't play in so many games. So uh, my body was able to mature uh, to its fullest without having any arm injuries or, or overthrowing as a young pitcher. And I think in the long run, looking back, that uh, that helped me a great deal. And, I, you know, I had great coaches. Uh, I mentioned Eddie Lopat, Johnny Sane, so influential. And I played on great teams. With the, with the Twins in the 60s, they always said, boy, if the Twins ever get some pitching. So when Johnny came and we got Mudcat Grant, that's when we, you know, we finally won the pennant in 65. All right. And then you got into broadcasting after your playing career was over. What what got you into that and how did you how did you end up on that side of the game? Well, before uh, before cable television, uh, if there was a rain delay, they would call some players up to the booth just to visit. So I remember in uh, 
in Chicago, Wrigley Field, as were the Phillies. And Richie Ashburn and Harry Callis sent down to have me come up to the to the booth and just talk baseball. So uh, there was a young man with Major League Films, Jody Shapiro, and uh, he happened to be there then. And he said to me, you, you should think about getting into this business when you're done playing. Of course, when you're playing, you think you're going to play forever. So you don't think that far ahead. <laughs> then when, uh, when the baseball strike of 81 hit, uh, he got a hold of me and he said, we're going to carry minor league games during the strike. Would you like to work some games with Ralph Kiner? So the first game I worked was Rochester, Syracuse. Cal Ripken was shortstop for Rochester. So that's that's kind of how I got started. I did some uh, I did some Good Morning America reports for David Hartman, and uh, and then and then some postseason stuff for uh, for him World Series games. And I remember in '83, uh, Jack Buck was there doing the World Series, and I was doing the reports for. For David Hartman and Jack uh, said, uh, "You thinking of you getting into this business?" And I said, "Well, I don't know." They asked me to give it a try. I don't know if I'll do well at it or what. So he called me off to the side, and I thought he was going to really give me some sage advice, you know. And he said, real softly, he said, uh, "Don't ever tell him how easy it is. Just cash the checks and smile." <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was how I got into it. And then, uh, of course, doing the Yankee games, Tony Kubek. Uh, kind of handed off his position to me when he retired and recommended me. And that was uh, maybe the biggest break I got. And and then you got to, you know, broadcast through the Yankees dynasty there. Just was there one, one moment or one, one season that really stood out from the broadcasting standpoint that was particularly memorable? Well, I, I think from all the years of covering the Yankee games, I covered them for 13 years, I think, 95, when Derek Jeter got called up. That 1998 team was probably, and still is for me, the best all-around baseball team of that era. I think you can go back to the Oakland A's that don't get enough credit in the early 70s. Everybody talks about the Big Red Machine, but the Oakland A's beat the Big Red Machine. Uh, but in 98, with uh, Tino Martinez and Derek had just, uh, you know, become the player he was to become, uh, they just had everything. They they had enough power. They had starting pitching. They had guys that were good two-strike hitters. They made productive outs. They hit sacrifice flies. And, of course, they had a great bullpen. That's when uh, Mariano was still a, a setup man and John Wetland was, uh, was the closer. Uh, the most exciting – it wasn't during that time, but I'd still say one of the most or probably the most exciting game I did in Yankee Stadium was when I was with the MLB Network and we did Derek Jeter's last home game. Uh, that was that was quite a night uh, because, as I told Bob Costas, I said, this will be the easiest game we ever had to do. All we have to do is sit back and watch and cover Derek. We had a dedicated camera on him from uh, – the time he walked in the clubhouse and by his own admission, he will say it's the most nervous he's ever been playing a baseball game, but that was a magical night. For sure. And I mean, he grew up not too far from Zeeland, Michigan there in Kalamazoo. Uh, just what do you, what are your memories of covering him? And, and just, did you ever talk about that, that you guys were, you know, from so close together? Oh yeah. I, kid, I kidded him about it uh, when he became the star that he became. Because I said back years ago, if a if a prospect came out of southwestern Michigan, they would say, well, where's he from? And they would say, well, he's from right near Zeeland, Michigan, where Jim Cott is from. And then fast forward about 20 years, they'd say, where's he from? And he said, well, he's from Kalamazoo, where Derek Jeter is from. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to know Derek's uh, parents, you know, Charles and Dorothy and and man, what a job they did raising uh, Derek and his sister. Uh, that was a real treat uh, carrying him, uh, covering him. I'd have to say one of the most thoughtful phone calls that I got in 2022, uh, my Hall of Fame induction year, is that the night before the induction, which is on a Sunday, every one of the inductees got a call from Derek saying and apologizing that his uh, his family had COVID, 
and he wasn't going to be able to come to Cooperstown. We talked about it uh, last year when he was there, but uh, that was so thoughtful of him to call and, and kind of apologize for not being able to be there. But if you know Derek, that wouldn't surprise you because he right. that's the way he is. For sure. All right. In 2022, I mean, a lot of people uh, thought you could have been in the Hall of Fame in 1992. Um, you know, you this this was such an incredible year of induction where you had I mean, the people who waited the longest all got in together. You got in the same year as your teammate, Tony Oliva, same year as Gil Hodges, same year as Minnie Minoso, same year as Buck O'Neill. Um, just take me through just what what the what the waiting part was like and just how uh how big of a deal it was that you and tony especially got to go in together after that long wait well i think the long wait you know i was curious uh when my career uh ended and when i was first eligible because uh, uh my win total was right there with robin roberts and fergie jenkins but obviously i knew i was not the dominant pitcher they were uh fergie was I understand, and, and we become good friends. One of the one of the joys of being part of the Hall of Fame is you get to know these guys as people. Become good friends with Lee Smith and Fergie, and uh, like Fergie said in support of me, he he won one more game than I did, but he's a dominant pitcher. So I soon realized that the starting pitchers that get in the Hall of Fame were the perennial All Stars, the perennial uh, opening day pitchers, the dominant pitchers. I I wasn't in that category. And I probably the first pitcher, and I hope that we can get Tommy John in there soon. The first pitcher that was, uh, you know, inducted because of accountability and longevity. Uh, and very simply, you, you have to have the right 16 guys in the veterans committee. Right. And I was fortunate to, you know, to get it right on the number. Um, I got a call on Monday morning from Dick Allen's widow, Willa. And Dick and I were so close and she, oh, Dick would be so excited. And I said, well, I think about this. If it came down to that last voter and he had a choice between Dick or myself and he voted for Dick, I'd be calling you. Dick missed by one vote. So the weight I understood uh, after a while, I said I just wasn't the dominant, dominant pitcher like the other Hall of Fame starters that are in there. But then, you know, when it actually did happen, um, uh, selfishly i was hoping that both tony and dick would get in but to go in with tony uh my longtime teammate who is still a a great friend going back to 19 you know in the 60s when i used to take him out for dinner to places he could speak very little english so that was a thrill and it was also a, a thrill to see minnie and, and gil hodges sit next to gil's daughter so yeah, that was a magical year. In, in in retrospect, I don't think I'd want it any other way. It was worth the wait. And I, I mean, I've known Tony a bit too, and my goodness, I've never seen him just so happy. <laughs> he yeah. he was he was the life of the party, uh, and just it it just you knew it took a toll. I mean, I mean, and you've told me many times over the years. You know, he did. You know, whenever we talked to, for stories or whatever about your candidacy and your votes, that you you would always say, "Well, Tony deserves to get in before I do." Um, yeah. And just watching watching that was pretty um, was was pretty spectacular. I mean, he had the long. I think you and he had both had the longest the longest waits of anybody on there. And you guys, I mean, he got so close so many times. But man, yeah, just just watching watching him and you guys. You guys were both 83 years old. I mean, you very, I mean, many had died a couple of years before. I mean, obviously right. Gil, Gil died quite a bit before, but I mean, you know, you guys were both there to experience it. And and I just think that that's, uh, that was incredible. And and on a personal note, just being able to, to be there in person and watch this, uh, watch it happen was, was incredible. Um, and it was, it was just a lot of fun, but um, so you hit, you touched a little bit on 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 Dick Allen. We had some questions in the chat in the chat about your who your favorite teammates were. I don't know if you've ever picked a favorite teammate, but I know that you and Dick Allen got along very well, and and you have some stories about him. Uh, just what what was that like being a, a teammate of of Dick Allen, and and just maybe what are some of the misconceptions that people have had about him? Well, I, I think first of all, yeah, when I got when the White Sox picked me up, Dick was injured most of that year in '73, 
but then in 74, when, when I started pitching and we played together, he, he liked the fact that, uh, you know, I was a baseball player that just happened to be a pitcher. And uh, he, he liked that, the fielding part of it. And, uh, you know, he was the kind of guy that learned under Gene Mock how to move the man over. And I think we both took pride in being baseball players. And, uh, you know, he was just legendary, the things that, that he could do. I think if Dick had come up with the Cardinals, where they had a lot more black players, my good friend Bill White was there, then along came Gibby and Kurt Flood, Lou Brock. I think if Dick were part of that group, his off-field problems would not have been as harmful to him than coming up in Philadelphia, which you have to say was a racist town, you know, sure. towards their athletes. And they threw things at him. That's why he wore a hard, hard hat in the field. And, uh, you know, that, that, that turned him to be pretty bitter. But then when I saw him in, Chicago, that 72 team re-inspired him. He almost carried him to the championship. And uh, we just hit it off so well uh, that it was a real joy to play with Dick. I think that might be where walk-up music started. Because Nancy Faust, the longtime organist, Dick was on a tear in 72. And when he came up, she played Jesus Christ Superstar, and he hit one in the upper deck. And so from that time on they played that song every time he came to bat i'm sure dick didn't care might not have even known but but that's right. when they did it but uh, i wouldn't have time to tell you all the legendary stories uh, about dick on the on the playing field i'll give you one quick one uh nolan ryan was pitching a no hitter against us and i was giving up like two hits an inning double play here and there i'd given up a home run to frank robinson the top of the second so I get him out in the top of the ninth and we're, we're trotting off the field and uh, he pats me on the butt and said, old timer, we're going to win this one. And he hits, uh, I think there may have been, no, there was, I think it was a leadoff hitter. He hit like a two or three hopper to, uh, to Rudy Mioli at third, who just sort of looked at the ball and threw it zing, Dick beat it out. Uh, we bunted him over. They threw the ball away. We ended up getting a sacrifice fly and a single. And we win the game two to one. If he doesn't hustle down the first baseline, uh, we don't win that game. So there's those are the kinds of things that Dick did. He was more than just a, a slugger. You know, he was a complete, complete baseball player. And now that you're a Hall of Famer, I mean, I know that you would endorse uh, Dick Allen. Obviously, he's missed by one vote twice. But we've we've talked over the years about him and uh, you know Tommy John and Louis Tiant as a hall of famer now, what do you see? Who do you see that, you know, that you think belongs, uh, you know, especially from your era? Well, I think TJ's first, I used to, TJ and I would talk about it. And I said, you know, if you get in uh, and I don't, I would be disappointed. If I get in and you don't, you should be disappointed because quite frankly, I talked to Tommy, I think about a week ago and, uh, and I said, if I'm on that committee, I'm going to I'm going to state your case. I said, you deserve to be in there before me. What what probably hurt Tommy is is everybody. I said, a lot of people think you're a doctor. You know, they think you operate. <laughs> Tom well, he won more. Yeah, he won more games after his surgery than he did before. So uh, I think a lot of people don't recognize the fact that it's kind of like I look back to Yogi. Yogi was known for his humor and his his sayings that all of a sudden you look at this movie, it ain't over till it's over, and you realize, man, this guy was a three-time MVP, all those World Series rings. He was a great right. player. But when you mention Yogi Berra to the average person, they just think kind of his different sense of humor. And with Tommy John, they think of his surgery instead of uh, what his career was. And then you mentioned Dick. Uh, I, I tell you what, I think uh, I think there's a lot of guys out there that are right on the verge with now the attention paid. Uh, I'm talking to Steve Hurt from the Elias Sports Bureau about this, and I know they used uh, my my record to compare to some comparables that were in the Hall of Fame, which helped me. And I think in uh, in Dick's case and in TJ's case, you start looking at. Uh, like if CC Sabathia gets it, you got to look at Mickey Lolich. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the career Mickey Lolich had with his durability. 
300 innings year after year. Um, yeah, there's uh, Al Oliver. Right. There, there's there's a lot of characters that uh, you remember the Sh- you remember Mike Shalen in Boston, the writer, mm-hmm. and, and he and his brother wrote that book called Out by Step. Right. I was in that book at the time. Right. But there are a lot of guys that are right on the verge there that once you start saying, well, he's in, then why isn't this guy in? And right. uh, unfortunately, as time goes by, the younger writers, uh, we even have it with the Twins Hall of Fame up in, in Minnesota. As I, I said to Dave St. Peter, the president, I said, we need to have a veterans committee. We've got guys like Dave Goltz and Roy Smalley. Uh, that that should be in Frank Quillacy, that should be in the Hall of Fame. But a lot of the a lot of the younger players and writers, they they don't remember them. Right. And I think it's the same way with the uh, with the players that we mentioned too. For sure, for sure. And uh yeah, Al Oliver. Uh my favorite stat about him is it's, it's shouldn't be my favorite stat, but only guy with twenty seven hundred hits, five hundred doubles and a three hundred career average, not in the Hall of Fame, Al Oliver. There's wow. Your answer to that question. So, um, that's, uh, you know, and we, we, lots of, lots of great, lots of great players, obviously. Um, Joe Maurer just got in and inducted this, this year. Now as a, as a twin, what did it mean to you? Uh, not only that he got in on the first ballot, which I think we, nobody necessarily thought was a lock to get in on the first right. ballot, but just as a, as a twins hall of famer to be able to, to welcome him. Uh, what, what was that like? Oh, that's going to be so great. You know, I, uh, I didn't talk personally to Joe. I left them all the inductees a message because I know they're busy and got media responsibilities and so forth. But I, I told all the Minnesota people when they say, you think he'll get in the first ballot? I said, you just have to sit back and be patient because Yogi Berra didn't get in on the first ballot. Right. You're right. I mean, Yogi Berra, believe that. Right. So Go to get in on the first ballot was fantastic. And it's such a great story because he was a high school star there playing in his hometown, played the whole career with one team. Uh, He's such a first class guy. And I mentioned the other night, my speech in Alabama, I said, uh, we should be so proud of the last five inductees into the hall of fame, Fred McGriff, Scott Rowland, Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, and Joe Maurer. Not only great playing careers, they are all high character, quality individuals that represent the game of baseball the way we would like to have it represented. Definitely, definitely. All right, I got a few few questions from the group. First one, what baseball memorabilia do you still have? Well, I still have my old glove that I used for 15 years. I think I will... I donate that to the Hall of Fame. I have the ball that hit me in the teeth in 1962. I had the te- I had fragments of the teeth in it for a while, uh, and I didn't put it in a lucite case. I remember the Bubba Morton. <clears throat> oh, uh, he, he was a tiger, and he had a one hop skipper off the off the wet grass and hit me in the in the mouth. And the ball hopped over to third. Rich Rollins threw it to Vic Power. And I'm laying on the ground and Vic comes over and says, you want to keep this for a souvenir? You know, uh, <laughs> Jim Bunny was actually the first guy to the mound, but I still have that ball with the teeth marks in it from 1962. Uh, I think those are the two things that, uh, that stand out the most that, uh, that I have, but I, you know, I have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, personally, personal autograph baseballs from uh, all hall of famers like Yogi and Ted Williams and, uh, Whitey Ford and on and on. So that's, that's kind of a memorable uh, uh, collection, but I think the glove and the, and the baseball are probably the two unique pieces of memorabilia that I have. For sure. Uh, next one, uh, 1967 pennant race, you know, with, uh, with four teams, what do you remember most about that season? Well, unfortunately, uh, you know, I get credit for starting Red Sox nation because uh i hurt my elbow the day before uh the uh we had that we had to win one of those two games and i was pitching the saturday game and that was the best month of pitching in my career i think i was seven and oh and i had averaged like nine innings to start 
And I think that's the reason my, my elbow kind of gave way because uh, Hawk Harrelson and Yaz have always said, if you didn't hurt your arm, I don't know if we'd have won that game, but uh, that was so much fun in September pre playoffs, because when you came to the park, every game was like a playoff game because sure. there were four teams that had a shot at it until the last week. Then the A's knocked off the White Sox. But even after the Red Sox beat us on Sunday, uh, I went over to the Boston clubhouse to congratulate Yas and Yas, and they had a former teammate of mine that was on that team, Lee Stang. So I went over to, to congratulate them. Well, they were all huddled around the radio because they were still listening to the Tiger Angel game. Okay. When that ended with Dick McAuliffe hitting into that line drive double play. Uh, but that was, uh, that was a great month of baseball to be a part of. For sure. Okay. I got a couple more. Um, for uh, what do you think of the pitch clock? And do you think a pitcher could pitch 250 to 300 innings today in today's game, or does the training prevent that? Well, I think the pitch clock, uh, I'm sad that it had to happen, but it was a necessity. Uh, you know, science has invaded the game and players are waiting to be told from the sideline what to pitch, what to throw. And that was dragging on and the games were boring and long, but the pitch clock has remedied that. Um, unless baseball comes to their senses, this is even a plea from the commissioner who has told me personally, he said, we need to get the starting pitcher matchup back, the marquee, Mickey Lolich against Sam McDowell or stuff like that. We don't have that. Right. And they're paying $25 million a year for a pitcher who can give them five innings and go through the lineup twice. So until that training starts, um, it's laughable that a pitcher that pitches 180 innings now is called an innings eater. Right. I think the way we were trained, we were just kind of getting into the flow of the season. You know, we were, right. uh, what they would say in spring training, well, you have any goals? I said, my goal every year is to start 40 games and pitch 280 innings. Uh, I didn't achieve that every year, but you know, if you pitch, if you average seven innings to start and, uh, and your manager uh, had enough faith in you to send you to the mound 40 times, chances are you're going to have a pretty decent year. But until they, uh, until they get away from the specialization of the game, uh, I don't think it's going to change. I remember Bill Lee and I talking about this years ago, and he used that quote from Buckminster Fuller. He said, you know, Buckminster Fuller said, specialization breeds extinction. And I said, that's what's happening to the starting pitching. All the specialization is kind of make, making the starting pitcher uh, insignificant. For sure. Okay, a um, couple questions about just, uh, let's see, you played with Reno Bertoia. Do you have any memories for, about him? Oh, I just remember Reno, uh, you know, getting some bonus money and, and uh, I think he was originally with the Tigers, right? And uh, came out of mm -hmm. Canada. Uh, so I remember my time with him. I, I don't know if he was the, he may have been the third baseman in my first start. It was either he or Eddie Yost, but certainly I remember Reno's name and, and being his teammate. And then, uh, Gary mentioned at the very beginning, uh, Roland Heeman, uh, is another, you know, great person in the game. You know, you've, he crossed paths with him quite a bit at times. What, what was your relationship like with him? Well, you know, I was, uh, when the twins put me on waivers in 73, uh, and I knew they would, I wasn't pitching that well, but I remember telling Bob Rogers, our bullpen catcher, I said, you know, I'm just coming back from this broken wrist that I had from sliding into second base in 72. And I said, I'm not done yet. I'm going to be fine. Well, I'm out at Minnetonka country club playing golf. And all of a sudden the kid drives out in a cart, and didn't have cell phones. He said, there's a, there's a man on the phone in the clubhouse wants to talk to you. His name's Roland Heeman. So I said to the guys, well, I got to drive in and take this phone call. He said, well, we just claimed you off waivers. Uh, and he said, you, you are the first player to come under the five and 10 rule. 10 years in the big leagues, the last five with the same team. So he said, you can turn it down. And I said, first of all, I said, uh, Mr. Heeman, that, that surprises me because I had heard the Yankees and the Royals who were both in the running for a win in the division were interested, but I'm surprised that, uh, 
that you claim me because the White Sox were not in contention then. And he said, well, Chuck Tanner and Johnny Sane, they, they think you got some something left and we're looking ahead to next year. I was making $60,000. And he said, we're prepared to give you a contract next year for $70,000. I said, well, can you send the pin over the phone line? I want to sign that in a hurry. <laughs> Calvin Griffin would have asked me to take a ten thousand dollar cut. So, right. and then after I had the two good uh, twenty game seasons, then Roland came to me and said, "You know, Mister Allen's losing money, and uh, he's 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 going to have to make a deal, and he thinks he can. We think we can get some young players for you." And both the the Pirates, the Phillies, and the Mets all wanted a veteran pitcher in '76. So Roland said, if we could work out the deal, where would you like to go? I said, I'd love to go to the Phillies. My dad was a great Philadelphia Athletics fan. Uh, I've seen their team. They're getting better every year. So Roland did work it out. Uh, they got Ralph. They ended up getting Ralph Gard. They got a couple of top draft choices. So Roland and I, for years, we always had that mutual admiration society that, that you know, he helped my career. And then Harry Carey was very critical. What are they doing picking up this guy at 35 years old? And they end up getting, you know, some good players in return for the trade. So it was good for both of us and uh, met his family in, in 22 when I was inducted and uh, Roland and I stayed close friends. All right. And then uh, one about, not necessarily about baseball, it, were you always left-handed and what do you play with other sports? And I know I can answer this a little bit. I know that you play golf both handed. And for those of you who don't know, he has shot his age both handed. Uh, and that is a fact, not me blowing smoke um, <laughs> in golf. So, um, but were you always left-handed and then just talk a little bit about uh, your golf game? Yeah, I was, uh, I was always left-handed when in the era that I grew up, my older sisters would take the ball out of my left hand, put it in my right, because it was not, socially acceptable to be a lefty but I ended up being a, a lefty in everything I did uh, and played a little first base and a little outfield which were both both left and uh, conducive to being left-handed I, I think one of these days we'll see a left-hand catcher because there's more left-hand hitters but then uh, yeah I, I think the golf thing I, I took it up late uh, relatively speaking I was in my 30s and they didn't have left-hand equipment unless you special ordered it. The only real player of note, Bob Charles, who had won a major championship, is from New Zealand. He was the only lefty. So I just learned to play the game right-handed. And then when left-handed equipment came along, I I switched and I still do. Uh, I'm off for a while now because I, uh, I had a pacemaker put in about a month ago. And now uh, Monday I'm getting a new hip. So I've been off my golf game. I won't get back to it till March, but... Uh, I still play a little each uh, right and left. And just how big of a deal has that been? Uh, just being able to golf and you carry, carry a sport like that, you know, into your eighties. Yeah. I think that's what's so cool about the game. I mean, the pro game, my friend Jerry Tardy wrote a great article in golf digest about the, the brokenness of pro golf, but, uh, just for a pastime to be able to play and the people I've met, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful game to, to play. And I'm very fortunate that regardless of how well I play, uh, I really have a, a lot of enjoyment socially continuing to, to play it. All right. And last question now, what do you, what is the game need baseball? What does baseball need now? Or what's, what, what do you think uh, needs to be, uh, fixed in the game well we we need the starting pitcher matchup and and not necessarily the game within the foul lines of the big league level but we what baseball needs the sport i talked to a friend of mine who's a physical therapist this morning uh because I'm, I'm i'm trying to to come up with a way to help young kids develop a mechanically and kinetically proper motion and keep them off the operating table well Vinny Perez, the physical therapist, he has about eight or 10 15 year olds coming in rehabbing for Tommy John surgery. So we have to find out a way to start stopping these injuries. I mean, I don't think the Dodgers have a pitcher on their staff that hasn't had at least one and maybe two surgeries. 
So we need to help that. We need we need to fix that. But yeah, I'd like to see the starting pitcher matchups come back. Um, the science. I remember when Statcast came on the scene, everybody got gaga about it, and I said to my friends, "That's the worst thing that could happen to the game." We got science coming into the game. Uh, you know, that's what affected Dan Campbell making those decisions, and he got blasted for it. If we didn't have all those propeller heads saying, hey, at fourth and two, it's a good percentage you can make it. Well, yeah, maybe against Pop Warner team, but not the San Francisco 49ers. So, you know, but the, but he's influenced by those kind of decisions. And that's what we're seeing in baseball. And I wish that we could get back to just throwing the ball out. Here's the ball. You guys got a lot of talent. Go play the game. For sure. All right. I got one, one last quick one that popped in. What do you think about Guys like Johnny Sane, should there be a place in the Hall of Fame for elite coaches? Uh, we, you know, obviously there's a place for managers and stuff, but there's been a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of great pitching coaches and and other kinds of uh, coaches over the years. Oh, I think there should be, and I think John would be at the top of the list, you know. And then there'd be there's going to be a lot of hitting coaches too. I mean, Walter Iniac got a lot of credit for helping hitters, so uh, certainly there should be a. Uh, I mean, there is in football, my friend, Bill Parcells, uh, you know, he's a head coach, but he's, uh, he's in the hall of fame. And yeah, I, I think there should be a, a, a wing for coaches. And obviously I'm a little biased, but I think the first, uh, the first coach to, to get in there would be Johnny. I mean, he's had a history of producing 20 game winners over a long period of time. So I hope someday there is. Sounds good. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us. It's uh, always a pleasure. Uh, and uh, yeah, we wish you the best. Thanks, Dan. Always a pleasure. Hope to see you in Holland. You bet. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye now. Thank you, Jim. That was a great interview. You're a great, great, great um, conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Okay. So we have our panel coming up in 15 minutes. Uh, Cody Stavenhagen and Rogelio Castillo are already on board. Uh, time for everyone to get their, refresh their coffee or grab a bite or go to the commode. Um, Dan, you want to chat a little bit about the, the interview with Jim while we have some extra time? Sure. I mean, just first of all, um, getting to go cover his induction uh, in 2022 was just amazing. Um, I've been uh, covering his post career. I'm not old enough to have really seen him play. He retired when I was two years old. Uh, but watching you didn't go to games when you were two, what was I, wrong with you? Maybe I did. I don't know. But I don't. Uh, the first. <laughs> That the the first game I remember was much later than that. We'll just say, uh, but I actually don't know if my parents took me when I was younger. Uh, but um, you know, it was most of my covering of him was you know it was all his post career. There was some broadcasting stuff, but he was always a you know finalist for the Hall of Fame. It was always a it was always a every year we talked about how close he was this time, how close he was this time. It was so amazing to actually call him and talk to him after he made the Hall of Fame. Uh, but just being there and watching people that I've written about for a long time, Minnie Minoso was a huge, you know, was the the um, first Black Latino star. As you know, as much as a lot of casual baseball fans just think of you know think of Clemente as being the first Latino star Clemente is the most important Latino star but Minnie Minoso was an all-star seven years before Clemente was in the big leagues and ushered in this era to see him finally get in to see Gil Hodges finally get in to see um and Tony finally get in and Buck obviously finally get in was just such a huge even emotional thing for me uh to watch and just to see them now the four people that have that waited the longest in Hall of Fame history are now in their spot in their corner two and two. They are next to each other. So if you go to Cooperstown and you find Jim Cott's plaque, it is next to Tony Oliva, his longtime teammate for all time. So who knows who he would have been because they do it alphabetically and then by year. So it just so happens that because of when they got elected and alphabetically who got elected, 
that they will, you know, forever be right next to each other, which is like one of the coolest things, um, you know, for some people that have, you know, waited as, as long as they have. And it's just, as you all noticed by, you know, just by the conversation, Jim hasn't changed by being a Hall of Famer. He hasn't changed since he was younger. He's just, uh, you know, he always, uh, he's never turned down an interview with me. He's never, you know, not gotten back to me. He's, he, he tried to be on one of our groups before, um, but there was, uh, you know, like a real issue that happened. You know what I mean? Like this is, the, you got the genuine Jim Cott, which is um, amazingly what everybody gets um, with him. And that, that, like Gary said at the beginning, there's very few people um, really like that. And uh, just, just experiencing him from not not somebody i watched playing but just somebody i you know watched carrying themselves as at first as a fellow media professional but just as a as a former player and now hall of famer is just it's been one of the best parts of my career so uh that was uh super fun yeah to be to be fair um stars and superstars especially um have to protect themselves because the media is relentless and even fans can be uh, really annoying at uh, to be polite and even worse than annoying. So it's not that um, some of these people aren't nice guys, but they get to be real closed off. Right. It's, it's a real tribute to a guy who can remain himself and keep the same personality while negotiating fame and fortune. Right. And, and, well, and you know, I understand the guys who want to close themselves off and some of them even become angry or bitter, but you know, it's just, it's just a rare thing to see someone like Jim. Right. I mean, I, I'd say we all agree that one of the best players and, you know, ambassadors of Detroit baseball is Al Kaline. He's a tough interview. He is very, he was, you know, he was very stoic, very quiet. Like it was, it was not, he didn't, he didn't uh, like getting interviewed, you know, like it's a very different situation and not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's just such a, it's just such a difference. Um, you know, just in talking to somebody like Jim, to your point, how rare that is. I mean, there's not that many, um, you know, former players out there, uh, like that. Right. And, and I also wanted to mention that Harmon Killebrew is one of these rare people that mm -hmm. no one ever says a bad word about. Right. Tony Leva, too. I mean, that team was loaded with, uh, you know, just people. He's Tony Leva's the same way. It's a little um, it's there's there's not a language barrier, but he's his English isn't is isn't his best. But he is he is always happy to talk as well. Um, and I, you know, yeah. And, you know, somebody put in the chat rod crew, too. I've never had a um, I've never had a bad chat with him either. You know, so like there's a. Uh, there's something to be said about that the twins but also like the midwest think about the people from michigan like we talked about smoltz cot jeter ted simmons Geringer, newhauser kai kai kyler these are like the i mean jeter's star got big because of where he played and what was happening but these are the put your hard hats on and go to work guys that you know like charlie Geringer never like you never, you never heard him talk ever. I never, I mean, like you look at old, old clips and everything. He lived until the eighties and you never hear him say anything. Cause he was just, he didn't care. Didn't want the spotlight, hard hat, go to work. That's how the Midwest teams like their stars. Detroit is filled with people like that with Geringer and Kaline and Crawford and Heilman and Greenberg. And like, it's just, and Trammell and Whitaker, like it goes on. Like that is something very, blue collar Midwest, um, you know, about teams like that. And the twins, you know, ha have had a lot of that too. And, um, you know, other, I, I feel like that's a, a very Midwest characteristic. Yeah. I, something just occurred to me. I hadn't thought about this, but we have on the chat here in the zoom, uh, the Tony Oliva's biographer, Tom Henninger, Tom say hello or wave your hand. Tom um, did a really terrific biography of Oliva maybe, what, 10 years ago? Tom, Something like that. Yeah, I published in 2015. And um, it's not just a story about Oliva and the twins. What I found most interesting, it's got extra dimension. It's um, 
it's a really good book for explaining what life was like if you were coming from a Latin country, in this case, particularly Cuba, what life was like until you got into the majors and the the rabbis you needed along the way to help you. And these, uh, they're very good. Um, and the obstacles you encountered. So it's it's not just a biography of Oliva and the, the 60s, 70s twins. Uh, so I highly recommend it. I also want to acknowledge we now have Mark Patterson, one of the principals of the Mayo Smith Society. Mark, are you one of the founders too? You're I'm muted. muting myself. No, I am not. I joined six years after it started, but two months after I arrived in DC. Okay. Anyway, uh, so I want to acknowledge Mark. If if you guys are any of you guys, I know most of the people out there are bleed tiger red and or excuse me orange and blue <laughs> if you do that you should join the mass smith society these guys define the word fan they are the truest most fervent and least obnoxious fans you could get for sure and just a note on tom's book uh the first quote about it on the back is by jim cott and also what i love the most about it and i'm a little biased i'm wearing my tony o shirt by the way today um I'm, just, impressed. I'm impressed covering uh, him over the years has just been such a joy i just i i got uh i got hooked and then just i like i said i had to go to the hall of fame to cover gyms uh and then just to have tony there too was amazing but my favorite part about this book now and it is there's a lot of great parts and it's it's a great book and i think i might have read it in one sitting um the first time but what it didn't do with a lot of books like with players like Tony or Gill or play, you know, fringe Hall of Famers, it did not try to make the case for Tony to be in the Hall of Fame. Like it def it talks about it. Uh, but the the purpose of this book was not to get Tony Oliva into the Hall of Fame. And that is a huge credit to the um, you know, the authenticity of the story because a lot of People obviously have an agenda when it comes to books like that, especially, you know, Gil Hodges writers and stuff like that. And I, I, I just appreciated that that was not the intent of the book. And I feel like I remember talking to you at one of the Sabre things where you, even after writing the book, you were you remained on the fence about whether he should be in the Hall of Fame or not, which I thought was uh, was really very genuine. I have to admit, I um. I told Tony that I thought it could be a tool to help him get in. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, that you typically of Latin players in those days, you, you weren't heard from, you know, it was like a third world country. You weren't heard from sure. unless something was wrong. And, uh, you know, I think that was something that hurt Latin players. People just didn't know them and to play in the Midwest was another thing. And, uh, but believe it or not, I have to say the way I sold Tony on it, was to tell him I thought it might help him get in the hall. And uh, well, I mean, it wasn't going to hurt, that's for sure. But yeah. like, but that wasn't like it didn't start with a preface saying Tony Leva belongs in the hall of fame. You know, exactly. like yeah. Um, yes. So it's it's a very it's one of the it's one of the better biographies out there. So everybody, if you uh, if you want, again, here's the. Well, thank you. Oh, uh, Tom, why don't you put a link to where you can buy the book? Put it in the chat so people can just click on the link if they want. Okay. Okay, so we're at 226. We're going to start the panel in four minutes. Hopefully Jason will join us. If not, I think Cody and Rogelio can fill up the uh, the uh, airspace for us and sure. Dan. Um, I'm going to refresh my mug of ice water and Thank I'll you. see you back here in three minutes. Sounds good. But every, every, everyone's free to chat or whatever while I'm away. So everyone's mic is uh controllable i have it set so you can unmute yourself you don't I, i'm not uh muting everyone on my uh from the host position
By the way, um, Rogelio posted in the chat at the start of the meeting the link to the trivia quiz I sent out, or I actually I don't send it out anymore. We just post it. Rogelio, if you can, can you repost that so people don't have to go scroll all the way back? Oh, I'm just trying to test Jason. There he appears in the waiting room. Okay, as soon as Jason is in, we will uh, start up again. Jason, Cody, Rogelio, should unmute yourselves. Dan, you uh, ready to go here? Yeah. Cody, Rogelio? I'm ready. Okay, so I'm going to start here in uh, one minute uh, at 2.30, so I don't jump the gun. Uh, I want to welcome uh, our guest, Cody Stavenhagen, uh, ace beat writer on the Tigers for The Athletic, uh, Jason Beck, uh, longest serving um, and maybe the nicest beat writer in Detroit. Jason's been with uh, the Tigers for since 2002, I believe, right, Jason? And is one of the few people who have covered all of Miguel Cabrera's career here. And I have it on from multiple sources that uh, you were the writer who was closest to uh, Senor Cabrera, which was not an easy trick to manage. Is that right? I mean, it's all relative. I, I, I guess so. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm not really sure how it came about, but but yeah. Okay, and Rogelio Castillo is a local blogger uh, and all around good guy. And I'm grateful to have a Latino member here to talk. Rogelio writes very, very uh, movingly about Latino ball players and gives us insights that us white guys aren't going to have. So I'm very grateful to have him here. Rogelio has the Tigers minor league report and uh, also writes for Motor City Bengals. Is that correct, Rogelio? That is correct. Thank you okay. for the warm introduction, Gary. Okay. I only invite my friends or people I like here. So, you know, it's easy, <laughs> easy to introduce them. Okay. So it's 2.31. Dan, you want to take over? Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, thanks everybody for joining us for the uh, Miguel Cabrera section of our program. Um, so, and Jason, uh, Jason and Cody, thanks for being back with us. I know you guys have done some stuff with us in the past. Uh, welcome back. And uh, Rogelio, you're on the kind of on the board with us. So you're never, you're never gone, uh, but good, to, <laughs> good to have, good to have you here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously this was a huge, you know, year for the Tigers being in the fact that it was Cabrera's last year. Uh, we had a lot of different things the last couple of years to cheer about. Um, just having anybody with a miles, milestone tracker in the ballpark uh, is was something kind of new. Um, and obviously we're talking about one of the, you know, the best players, uh, you know, of all time. So just we're trying to really, uh, the goal of this panel is to really look into his legacy a little deeper from you know people from different perspectives and and, and people that you know saw him on a day-to-day -day basis um you know especially for a number of years so um with that being said um you know Rahelio, I want to start with you uh this you know Detroit over the years you know for a long time long ago Detroit was a white town then Detroit was a black town uh and now Detroit is a melting pot and is, you know, seemingly on the rise. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with the, you know, the melting pot part of it. And it is just how big of a deal is it to have a ball player that kind of, you know, exemplified that and, uh, you, you know, that just kind of seemed to bring all, all together like that? 
Well, to me, it was a big deal because I look at it as the aspect of when I went to Tiger Games in the 90s, there wasn't anybody carrying around a Cuban flag to go into the games or a Venezuelan flag, even despite, you know, Jose Lima having, I mean, the the, the Tigers, in terms of prospects two-wise, weren't really, they had a, a spring in the early 60s, and then they just kind of, after that, it was Barrio Garbay, and then it just kind of, until the 90s. So um, growing up, in the Dearborn area in Michigan too, there wasn't, I was one of always, I was always the, the, the Cuban guy or the, whatever the case was. And so um, now I see Venezuelan flags. I see the, the Detroit Tigers doing Fiesta Tigres. And I think that's come a long way. And looking at the population, I still live in the downriver Dearborn area and to see the population go from Lincoln park now has a thriving Latin community that embraces baseball. It's just not just Southwest Detroit anymore either. It's a combination of everything. And so I think Miguel Cabrera being so Hall of Fame worthy really definitely helped. But it marked the first time that in my lifetime that I could have a a Detroit Tiger who can speak the language, who he did a lot with the community, but he's also just a representative of people that can come from all walks of life kind of thing in the Latin culture. And I think that's that's legend key to me because it's not just the Willie Hernandez's or who I mean I, I know there's several Tigers who lived in the area or really old Rodriguez lived in the area afterwards but Miguel Cabrera was that first superstar and I think it came at the right time for sure and Jason you've been here for his whole career here but also you've been around Detroit for so much of this um transformation that the downtown has seen and just the you know the vibe of the city um take me through your thoughts of you know the kind of correlation that Cabrera has with this um you know this new Detroit well I you know I I kind of when I when I think of Miggy's place in it I, I think of kind of you know where the iconic athletes in the city you know where they've placed in certain generations. Uh, I think people of a certain age think of Detroit sports and they think of Barry Sanders. Um, you know, there, there's obviously a, a Gordy Howe generation there. Uh, some people might think of Calvin Johnson or Matthew Stafford. Um, and then there, obviously there's there's Tram and Lou. Um, you know, I, I think Miguel kind of has his place in, in this generation now to where it's like, for a certain age, when they think of Detroit sports, I think the most iconic athlete for a stretch w- was Miggy. For sure. And and Cody, I mean, just bringing it also just past past Detroit. I mean, we are in the era now where we have, you know, that baseball has had the Latin impact, you know, since, you know, many, many years. So, I mean, really, you want to go back Martin DeHigo, but as far as in the mainstream you know, Roberto Clemente and on, but it's still Roberto Clemente was not, and many Mignoso didn't, they ushered in a lot of players, but they didn't necessarily usher in a lot of superstars back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And now we've got, we had an era where we had, you know, Cabrera and Pujols together, both playing the same position, both Latino, both, you know, two of the faces of the game. Just uh, how big of a deal just for the game in in general has has this been from your from your eyes? Yeah, I think one of the biggest keys to understanding the the life of Miguel Cabrera is is talking to people who either A, knew him uh, when he was growing up in Venezuela, or B, grew up in Venezuela watching Miguel Cabrera play. Venezuelan players in the game revere Miguel Cabrera. Um, I, I, one of the scouts that signed him once told me, my, uh, Miguel Cabrera is like Michael Jordan in Venezuela. And it's true. He is a, a completely different level of star in his home country compared to an already big level of fame in the U S mm-hmm. um, he he's an icon over there. There's a generation of Venezuelan players, Ronald Acuna being one of them and others that um, grew up worshiping Miguel Cabrera. He certainly influenced an entire uh, era of players and, and probably made, I don't know if he made the major leagues feel more attainable, um, but certainly is really the face of Venezuelan baseball. All right. And uh, Jason, I'm going to start with you first for this next one, um, since you've been here since since he got here. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about what it's been like covering him day after day, year after year. I mean, what was he like when he first came over? 
you know, how has that changed or grown or whatever? I mean, like I've gotten, you know, I've been in the clubhouses with you guys for some of the playoffs and the big, some of the opening days and the big moments, but not, not day to day. What, what has that been like for so many years, uh, you know, as that has grown? Well, I mean, it's really been a transformation. Um, and first of all, like it's hard to judge Miguel in the day to day because, you know, as Cody and Rod will attest, it's, you know, he's not somebody who talks every day. Um, he's somebody where you kind of pick and choose your, your spots in, the, in order to grab him. Some of that really is, you know, yeah, he's, he's a big star. And some of that is he, you kind of have to read his moods and, you know, there are some days he's just focused on the game or focused on whatever. And, you know, he's not somebody you kind of, you know, chew the fat with on a daily basis, but you kind of watched him over the years in Detroit. You know, you basically watched him grow up um, when he came in. He was the young star, um, you know, kind of playing underneath, you know, certainly more talented than, but but playing underneath the, the influence of, of, of Maglo Ordonez, um, you know, that Maglo was a huge influence on him. And I, I think Maglio helped, you know, helped him kind of grow up for, for lack of a better term through, through some of his, uh, through some of his younger offenses. Um, you know, I, I don't know if he realized quite, it took him time to realize what superstardom entailed here. He's not unique in that circumstance I, I think there's been a few players over the years who came to Detroit you know if they were traded from somewhere else thinking it was kind of a sleepy midwestern market only to realize that it's a pretty passionate sports town and that uh, if you're struggling they will get on you and it took him a while to understand that I think once he understood that and once he um kind of accepted some of the challenges both on and off the field. I think he kind of grew into that role. And then it's in the later years, you saw him kind of take on this elder statesman, um, you know, veteran type of role. Um, it wasn't a vocal leadership role per se. I, mean, I think he did a lot of things behind the scenes, but, you know, there was a ton of respect really for, you know, for years for younger players who came up who were kind of, didn't really know what it was like to to be around a player of that stature, let alone, you know, be his teammate and interact with him on a regular basis. All right, Rogelio, I mean, you've been around as a, a fan, but also as a, you know, media person and stuff too. What, what is, what is your, what is your take on, you know, watching him over the years? I, I, I think sometimes for me as a fan, I, it, you know, when you get into the media room, you have to step away from having that fan perspective because you're there to do a job. For sure. And if it wasn't for Co Cody, Jason, kind of, and everybody kind of warned me, like, he is kind of moody, I can understand to a certain extent. And I feel sometimes that it is, if, you know, as a fan, you always hear the, the well, he doesn't speak more English. And, and, and you see other less popular players, for example, everybody loved Don Kelly during that same period of time. Like Mel Cabrera, Miguel Cabrera was mashing the ball. And as a fan, I didn't understand that why, but then hearing people's perspectives about it, it was just really, it's always strange to me. And I, I just didn't, and even I understand again, his troubles off, off field troubles aside, the language barrier thing is always to me, just because coming from this, my parents who struggled speaking English, I think people for whatever reason, because you don't have full confidence in the language and it's just, it, it just seems like it's a, uh, well, he's not my kind of, he's not my player because I can't relate to him. And I don't know. I just think that some of that, that, that stigma that's out there is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so he is a temperamental guy to deal with. And, and I, like I said, just witnessing that firsthand, but I think some of his frustrations too, maybe perhaps is the fact that I think people, he's a lot smarter. He's, he's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing and don't let, I think fans because of not the command of lacking English or whatever the case was, I think in Detroit, I think to a certain extent he's underappreciated because of the language barrier alone. And I, I will stick to that because I've seen it firsthand. It's just sometimes why are we rooting for utility players? I know it's a Detroit thing, but you know, what he did in the Tigers uniform is impressive. Right. It's a good point. I mean, I remember those, I mean, 
But I think part of it is, you know, Don Kelly had those couple of postseasons where he really came through when you weren't expecting it. But at the same time, I totally get, you know, the the point of that, what you're saying. And like I like I said, I haven't I wasn't day to day covering the Tigers, but I've been at every postseason game that they've had in Comerica Park. And there's been times where I walked by Cabrera and his eyes were the scariest thing that I've ever seen after a loss that I knew I didn't want to go anywhere near. But at the same time, he also had some of the best quotes I've ever gotten from anyone uh, when he talks, because there's, if there's so much depth to it, even though there may be, even with the, you know, somewhat of a language barrier, he knew what he was saying and he understood what I, what we were saying. But even though they were some, maybe shorter phrases or whatever, when you put some of the stuff he said together, it was unbelievably, uh, I don't even know what the right word is. It was wisdom. It wasn't even intelligence. Like it was, there was a different, um, a different spin on that. So Cody, I'm going to jump over to you. What, I mean, that's obviously, uh, the language barrier specifically is, is something in every, every clubhouse, you know, in every, a lot of sports too. I mean, you, in the NBA, you deal with it with European players and stuff too. I mean, you, how do you, uh, or especially at first, how, how was that transition and how did you, were you, you know, able to, you know, sift through and figure, figure that part of it out for lack of a better way of asking the question. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this panel. Um, there are a lot of layers to Miguel, so we could certainly talk about it uh, probably for longer than the, the hour we're allotted here. Right. The language barrier itself is very interesting. I think Rogelio makes some astute points. I think it was certainly part of uh, the reason it was difficult for Miguel being in the public eye. Um, at the same time, I, I, I think after a little bit of being around Miguel, I think he uh, probably – knew and spoke English a little better than he let on at times. Um, I, I don't know that excuse is the right word, but it was uh, perhaps it not being his native language, sometimes a way to shy away from the media. As Rogelio said, Miguel was a smart guy, smarter than he gets credit for, smarter than perhaps even he probably portrayed himself at times, if that makes any sense. Another interesting perspective is is talking to some of the Venezuelan reporters who covered him. He could certainly be um, more friendly, more, you know, liable to sit there and, and kind of shoot the breeze with those reporters, but he could also be moody with them. Uh, wasn't always uh, incredibly more candid with them than he was the English speaking media. So it, the language barrier, I think, is part of the reason he, in my opinion, is not as beloved um, somewhat in Detroit and certainly nationwide as he should have been. Uh, but some of it was also his personality. I think at his core, he's a, a shy kid um, who fame probably impacted his human development in a big way. You know, if you read the Andre Agassi biography by J.R. Moringer, it'll it'll talk about you know the the maturation process stopping uh, at the point of fame or where tennis became an obsession. And I think that's relevant to Miguel um, in his baseball career. And the other comparison made is. Uh, unfortunately, alcoholism and, and how that often impacts the development process that at, at least at one point in Miguel's life probably played a role as well. Uh, so I think there were elements of a shy kid from Venezuela who suddenly was a star, an international star and put in front of the public every single day under the pressure to perform. Um, and I think he was never fully comfortable in that role. Now, the, the, the crux of Miguel is there are other times you could see him and he could be uh, vibrant and happy and dancing and laughing, and you never quite knew uh, exactly what mood you were going to get. So, you know, I think that's one of the good things. The public does have these images of Miguel um, laughing and having such joy on the field. Uh, there, there are also probably fans that don't fully realize the layers of complexity to this guy's personality. Um, he, he certainly, uh, had a lot of different sides to his personality and, and it was, uh, um, kind of picking out of the hat, which one you were going to get on a daily basis. For sure. For sure. And, um, Jason, I'll jump over to you on this. I mean, we mentioned the, the alcoholism part. I mean, you saw him deal with that at a younger age, you know, firsthand and just how that affected First of all, his, you know, his relationship with the media, but also just 
uh, you know, just how do you feel that he he handled that? And it seemed like for all as, as many superstars have, as have dealt with, you know, stuff in their lives like that, he he came out of it in a pretty good in a pretty good light. How was he able uh, how was he able to do that? Well, I mean, it, it was a rough go there in, in his first few years in Detroit. I, I think, you know, part of it might have, you know, related to the pressure of being a superstar and going from this young up and coming player in Miami who, you know, was certainly very talented, but was still kind of, you know, blended in as kind of a, a another player there to being a superstar here who's, you know, every game and, and also whose moves off the field were, were tracked and who the Tigers were clearly placing a lot of pressure on to kind of lift their franchise and take them to the next level. He, he felt that his first few years. And when he, and, you know, if he didn't come through, you know, he wore it. And, you know, that was, it was, it took a while for him to kind of learn how to comfortably wear that. And it took some people around him to let him know it's like, Hey, first of all, you can't keep going like this from a health standpoint, but also, you know, you can't be the young super superstar anymore. It, it's time to grow up. I, I think Maglio had a big impact that way as somebody that Miguel respected and somebody who, you know, had to, you know, become you know, settle into that superstar role himself in Detroit a few years earlier. But I also think, you know, Maglio's home life, getting that settled, made a huge difference for him. You know, the, for all he's been through, you know, he's one of those guys who married his high school sweethearts and is still with them. Like they've raised a family together. He's got he's got a kid in college. Like it. It's kind of amazing given everything they got through and given, you know, the level of superstardom that he experienced that, you know, that these relationships lasted. It doesn't always happen that way with superstars and with, with all the attention around them. And, you know, they, through some good times and bad, they made it work. So I think stabilizing there made, made a big difference. And I also, you know, he, he had to grow up and uh, it, some of that had to happen under the public limelight and some of that had to happen in the clubhouse with some candid conversations. For sure. And uh, Rogelio, I mean, just from, from the fan perspective of it, when, when this all started to come out about the alcoholism and stuff, I know that there was a, you know, collective, Oh crap moment, you know, from the fans. No, because that, that could go so many different directions. Um, and we had just seen, um, you know, we had just basically we're, we weren't too far off of the steroid issue where you got uh, people dealing with that kind of stuff and hiding from it and denying it, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the second that, uh, you know, that that story was out for a couple of days and, and then he he admitted that he had a problem. I for, for one, that was that was when I knew he was going to be our guy because everybody's got crap you know what i mean like so just from your perspective just take me through what that that bit of time was like um you know as a fan from my perspective as a fan then i think the biggest takeaway that i had the, the three takeaways was first and foremost there was a sentiment of people that said hey mistakes happen it's okay and then i think the second one that i, I the, the one that to me ruled the most was well He's he's a superstar. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be a role model and and da 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 and 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 those those are the same people that no matter what happens when something that effect and they will come out and publicly say whatever it is that I, I'm appalled and in reality we know you're not appalled. It's just knock it off. But um, all jokes aside, it's just but it's the third thing I think I took away from this all that I remember was how much he felt like in terms of fans felt like he let him down. I mean, this was around the time too, where the, he was out drinking with the white Sox during a division series. And so that st stayed along with him. He didn't under the, the optics on that was horrible. So I thought 
that comparatively speaking, plus the other thing that happened with him that was reported by Tony Paul and the infidelity and, and with those things, he, out of all those things that came out, I think him being a bad teammate, I think affected him the, the most. I think the alcohol, people make d- dumb jokes about it and were very rude and just kind of didn't understand. Um, He came away after that and cleaned up there with that. If, if, and so I think from a f- fan's perspective, there was other two, those other two incidents really stand out to me. He got really a lot of, a lot of heat for that, the White Sox series, especially. And so I, I think for the anger was, he's not a really good teammate. And that's the perception that came across. But we, for people that know the know, that's, a, that's the first thing away from the truth. He knows some people and he's comfortable around people that he knows. And so I, I just, that, that never sat well with me too, because how much grief he got with that. Because how often do we know that other people are doing that too? But just Miguel, because it was Miguel, and it was off this incident. I think it was amplified a lot, and I think it really affected his, at least from my perspective, his relationship with fans. For sure. And Jason, I'm gonna hop back to you on this. Um, the it seemed like not only did he kind of. Yeah, you know, obviously he owned up to the two things, which obviously keeps stories from lingering and whatever. But he seemed uh, like what he was saying. He he seemed like he genuinely felt like he was letting people down, whether it be the fans, his teammates, his family, whatever. It really seemed to affect him personally. How big of a deal did you see that part of it as, uh, you know, kind of springboarding, getting him through that part? Well, you know, one of the memories of Miguel I'll never forget was after the tie-breaking, the game 163 in Minnesota in 09, where if you remember, you know, they had the, I think it was the seven-game lead on Labor Day. You know, the Twins came out of, not nowhere, but they went on a crazy run. I can't remember the record, but it was something insane to go ahead and tie up the division. And then that last weekend with like two or three games to go in the, the regulation schedule, the story came out that, you know, Miguel had spent you know the night in a jail in Birmingham after, after a domestic incident. And Dave Dombrowski had to go bail him out for lack of a better term. And he showed up in the clubhouse with a black eye and you know, we all had to go tracking down what happened. I remember having to go to the Birmingham Police Department and get a copy of the police report. And so, you know, they ended up, you know, rallying to force the tiebreaker because even that wasn't uh, a given. And, you know, they they won on the, the game 162. And then they go to Minnesota and still story. And they have the insane game, you know, the... 13 innings, you know, Miguel homered in that game, which was quite the statement, but they lost. And after the game, I will never forget, Miguel was at his locker in the, you know, the tiny visiting clubhouse in the Metrodome, and he was crying. He was bawling his eyes out. And he he said, it's like, he felt like he was responsible for them blowing that division because of what came out in that final weekend. And that, if you know if maybe that hadn't happened, that they could have stabilized things and won it in 162, and they would have been going on to the playoffs. And I, I think that resonated with them. You know, there was there was another incident that following spring training, uh, on the way to spring training that the following spring. But I, I think it, you know, that was where you you was you kind of sensed that realization on his part that things off the field have an impact on the field and you know it took a while to to really put that sense into action but I I think it did resonate with him and when you saw him in you know in the years to come as he emerged to become you know batting champion Miggy and triple crown winner Miggy you know he wore that pressure he wore it more comfortably but he still felt it um when he was going for the Triple Crown in 2012, you know, he really didn't want to talk about the Triple Crown. He was talking about trying to help the team hold on to this vision because they were getting a push from the, the you know, the, the White Sox and Cleveland. So, you know, 
it really wasn't until the very end and with some prodding from Prince Fielder that he was finally able to enjoy winning the Triple Crown that year. All right, uh, Cody, just getting back to the point of, you know, coming off the, you know, the steroid era where it was a whole era of cover-ups and stuff, we still haven't uncovered everything. Just having a superstar that, you know, didn't really run from his demons. I know that it wasn't like, uh, you know, the next morning he wasn't like, yes, I, hi, I'm Miguel Cabrera, I'm an alcoholic. But in the grand scheme of things, he didn't run from this. How big of a deal was that just in the, in the scope of sports to have, you know, somebody on, you know, on the cusp of superstardom or even already at superstardom to have, to handle the issue the way that you saw. Yeah. Uh, in fairness, I wasn't, you know, around, I wasn't covering the team at that point in Miguel's career. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't love the the nice and tidy narrative that Miguel went through some adversity and cleaned it up and everything was great there afterward, because I don't think that's entirely true. Um, even off the field, his infidelities uh, spanned into the the later part of the 2010s. Basically, the guy had a, a secret family. Uh, the rumors of his drinking started when he was in the Marlins. They did not end, uh, you know, right after the second arrest. Uh, but you're right in that he wasn't able to run from it. He wasn't able to run from it because it was in the public eye and because the the police reports were public. And if you dig through the depths of some of the police and court records, it's uh, it's pretty disturbing. It, it goes a little beyond, hey, the guy went out and had too much to drink one night and got in the car. It's some of the things he told police. Uh, do, do you know who I am? Just kill me. Uh, some of the threats he made to someone at a restaurant, the issues with his wife. Uh, there was clearly a very tortured side of Miguel Cabrera. Uh, the, the guy probably does deserve some level of credit for being able to rein that in and continue to perform as we've said, in a very high-level, high-stress job for uh, the majority of his career. Uh, but but I think Miguel has battled personal demons uh, throughout his career, and and I would say, I've you know, in the five years I covered Miguel Cabrera, I said from the start, I'm a little worried about this guy after baseball. How is he going to replace um, this thing that has been his life and his livelihood and his focus? Will he be able to replace that? I think in my five years around Miguel Cabrera, I did see an interesting transition from 2019. I don't think he was fully willing to accept that uh, he was older and no longer the player he once was. And by 2023, there was a level of acceptance and reflection on his career and the great experiences. So I do think he came to a more peaceful place um, in terms of his baseball career. Um, you know, there's no way to see the future, but I'll be interested to see how, how some of these realizations and perhaps maturation impact his life after baseball. For sure. For sure. And Rogelio, I mean, just how do you see, I mean, there's a a lot of people that just can, couldn't have gotten through that, especially with, uh, you know, like you said, the ongoing demons, you know, at times, and it, it lasted longer than, you know, maybe than people think. How was he able to get out of, at least to become the superstar, the positive superstar in the public eye? I think just the silly moments that we we, we captured on social media of him, you know, making the faces and those little things like that, that I think he plays up to that quite a bit there with just kind of a lot of our superstars tend to be rooting for kind of button up. I'm not saying that lack of personality, but they just seem sometimes stiff. And baseball has always suffered, at least in my opinion, when people have colorful personalities, it's they're you know accusing of being hot dogging and what have you. But I think the way Miguel Cabrera won back the fan base a little bit, even when his injuries was just his sense of humor and just knowing where the camera was and and, and knowing how. But it also just. You could see him rooting on his teammates well, and 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 I've I've had fans say that to me that that the, the one of the things they notice when he, when anything happens good in the dugout, he's one of the first people to come up and say something, and so I think that helped them. I mean, my, this was my first spring training going last year, and it was it was very interesting to see the the, the people that surrounded him. He had he had he had a guy by the name of Angel Jesus who was a prospect, and. He also has some of the coaching staff. So it was like this wide variety of 
people from all walks of life around him who like Miguel was, I mean, he was trying to do karaoke. I, I think he was doing that karaoke. The bar. I, correct me if I'm wrong, Cody, at that night, the, the uh, Lakeland barbecue, but it was just, he, he knows where the camera is. And, and so I think panning up to that a little bit, as much as that might be viewed as superficial, fans loved it. And I think that's what really started enduring him to the public. All right. And Jason, um, let's, let's t- start to talk, let's talk a little bit more about just the, his, his career. I mean, you saw him transform from this, you know, a young promising person to a triple crown winner, four-time batting champion, you know, two-time MVP, also top five in the MVP voting seven times. I mean, this is somebody who dominated the game for a full decade. What was it from your perspective that ha- that made him stand out more than you know or more or differently from other stars of the time what did he do so well or differently at the plate and what you know what was the vibe like when he came up to bat during that time well the opposite field power was, was unreal um you know what he could do going to right field on a consistent basis was just incredible. And I think there, there was a key stage his first couple years in Detroit where, you know, Jim Leland, he saw the talent. I mean, we all saw, saw the talent upon arrival even before that. Um, at some point that first or second year, Jim and he, Jim tended to do this with, with, with some younger guys. He, he he tried to do some things with Verlander too, to where, you know, he saw the at bats where Miggy was focused, and how unbeatable he or how tough he was to to beat, and but he also saw Miggy taking some at bats off, like you know if the game was out of hand, or if it was late in the year and they weren't doing anything, like an 08. and at, at some point there. I can't remember what year, it might have been 09. Um, I said, hey, Mickey, you know, I want you for like a might have been like a two-week period. Don't take any at bats off, have the same focus every at bat, see how it feels and see what the results are like. And you know, let's see what you can do. And he had support there from from Lloyd McClendon, who as a hitting coach, I, I think had a bigger influence on him than he probably got credit for. But you know, coming out of that stretch, really, where, you know, when Mickey learns to have a consistent focus, um, you know, and in largely, largely trained himself, but w- with encouragement from Jim, I think that's when you saw the transition from this really talented hitter who could lead the league in home runs, they hit 300 to, okay, annual contender for the batting title, triple crown winner in 2012. MVP winner, MVP candidate year in, year out. And um, just uh, Cody, I mean, from your perspective, I mean, it was, uh, I don't remember exactly what year you got, you've been working in Detroit, but you've, uh, even even in his declining times, I mean, there's something about him as a hitter uh, and his, his, uh, his vision and his quickness. Uh, I mean, I, I think it was the last year, the year before, where I saw a game where I like he he fouled off like nine straight straight really really tough pitches and ended up getting a single. Now maybe he would have hit a homer ten years ago, you know, in that thing. But he still has all of all of that, you know, had all of that with him till the till the end. Even though his physical skills had deteriorated, to you, what was it that stood out most about him, especially at the plate? Yeah, I, I only started covering Miguel in 2019, so okay. certainly not anywhere near peak Cabrera. But some of the things you would still see out of him on the field from time to time were pretty remarkable. And if you go back further, just watching and talking to people, I, I, I think Miguel Cabrera is one of the absolute most talented players in the modern history of the game, along with probably Alex Rodriguez and King Griffey Jr., um, a guy with an incredible feel at the plate who until his final years when he was swinging off one bum knee when underwent very few mechanical changes, the swing he had uh, in his final years is nearly identical to the swing he had as a rookie or as an amateur playing in Venezuela. 
Um, and then you hear the legends from from pitchers and opposing players about how he had both the confidence and the ability to set up opponents at the plate. I mean, things like flailing at a slider, swinging and missing, knowing uh, the pitcher would give him another one later and at bat, and then, you know, whacking it to the opposite field wall. That's um, in a really, really hard game. That is incredible. So he had both this physical talent and uh, really the the savant of the baseball IQ of a, a true savant that um, is inc incredibly rare. When you really sit back and think about it, it almost brings the question. Miguel Cabrera is one of the greatest right-handed hitters of all time. Uh, had he taken a little better, better care of himself and been a little healthier, should he have been the greatest right hitter, right-handed hitter of all time? I think it's a real question because uh, some of the things he could do at the plate were were really unparalleled, even compared to some of the other uh, all-time great hitters. For sure, and we're going to get to that in just a couple of minutes. Um, Rogelio, um, just watching him come to the plate, um, whether it be as a fan or whatever, like. You've been a fan of the Tigers for a long time, you know, as as a lot of us in this group have. There was a different feeling when he came to the plate than when even when Cecil Fielder came to the plate or when Trammell came to the plate or even Maglio, you know, there was, there's just something about what is it, what was it that just as a fan separated, you know, what the realm of what was possible? I think I look at the uh, bat they had with Mar Mar Mariano Rivera in, in New York, the home run. That to me was an example of Miguel. He had him figured out. I mean, he he knew exactly what he was throwing. That cutter is one of the greatest cutters of all time. And watching that at bat live, you know, this is late. And you know, when Rivera, when when he went out there against, especially against Detroit, was always knocked out. It was just not, he would knock the Tigers out in order. He was that dominant. The C. Miguel Cabrera have a long, lengthy at bat, circa Dave Berkman in 84 kind of style, against a, a, a Hall of Famer, for uh, not to mention a, a unanimous Hall of Famer, mm -hmm. just to go out and just that was right there what made Miguel so different. Even when he was injured and then seeing him this year when his knees were going bad and just the muscle, just all muscle memory and just had the ability to, to drive the ball when he could and place it wherever he wanted. But that at bat to me, I, the triple crown season aside, which we'll talk about, I'm sure that at bat right there was that, you know, everybody talks about must see JV. That was must see Cabrera right there at his finest. That right there, just to have that ability to take a pitcher and follow him off, follow him off and just, and then even to, to get the tip of the cap from the hall of famer himself, that, that to me, just says everything about Miguel Cabrera. He is, he, he thinks, a little more, he's that much of an advanced hitter as a fan, just watching him just get one of the greatest of all time. All right, Jason, moving to that triple crown season. I mean, there, we obviously know the history there. We have not, you know, we have not had anybody near that in, in so, in so long. And, you know, very few have been, you know, even in the realm of the conversation, um, since since Yaz uh, or since Frank Robinson and Yaz did it back to back, what was the energy like around that at the end of the season, and just what made that season so special? Well, I mean, it it, it was a late emerging chase, um, so it, it probably didn't get nearly as much anticipation as it as it arguably deserved because I had. You know, we all saw, you know, batting average wise, he was in great shape. Like that's, he was typical Cabrera. And I think if I remember right, it was like the home runs and the RBIs mm -hmm. that came on late. And at some point there, like in, in August or September, you're looking up and it's like, hey, some crazy things would have to happen. But like, he might have a shot here. And if I remember right, like Curtis Granderson, his old teammate was one of the guys he was having to chase on the home run front. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you know, you had that running parallel with the Tigers who had not gone off to a good start that year, trying to come back and repeat as AL central champions. And, you know, and they had, ex they had high expectations because this was a team that, 
you know, had gotten to the ALCS the year before and was an up and coming, you know, young club. And they had added Prince Fielder and they looked like an unbeatable lineup. And for a stretch there, they were not. And even after they turned it on late, they were relying on Miguel for quite a bit of their offense. And so, you know, you had the team fortunes and Miguel's individual fortunes kind of running parallel and you were trying to track it all. And, you know, eventually you got to a point where you could, you know, it felt pretty comfortable for the team, but, and then you look up and it's like, Miguel might actually do this, but it really wasn't until I think those, those final few days where it looked like it was going to happen. And I think that probably, in some ways that probably helped because if you had put two, three months of triple crown pressure on Miguel, I don't know how he would have reacted. That, that, that would be a lot for many guys and especially for Miguel who did not like a lot of focus on individual feats. He had to adjust himself that way when we started chasing when we started tracking him for 3000 hits and 500 home runs. And during, during the, those earlier stages, you know, it's like, no, I, I, you know, I don't give a care if I homer twice in a game, if we lost, you know, we still lost. Um, so, you know, having Prince around help them to relax, having his teammates saying, Hey, enjoy this because it hasn't been done in 45 years. Uh, Goodness knows if anybody's going to do it again in our lifetime. So, you know, you, we, we are appreciating this. We would feel better if you did too. Uh, I think there was a sense of feeling on that, but it's, you know, it was something where I think the final day or two, you look up and it's like, you, you really appreciated then what you just witnessed because mm -hmm. it, it really, came on late to where, you know, it, there were, there was a stretch there where September maybe was something to behold. And that, that one was up there. For sure. And Rogelio, let's talk about that September. I mean, you, um, as Jason alluded, I mean, like the batting average, we weren't really so much worried about him. He ended up beating Mike Trout by four points, but it was, he was comfortably ahead. Um, you know, I don't think that, that that was something that didn't really ever seem like it was in doubt. And then he, about two weeks to go, it looked like he was, you know, well ahead with the RBIs. And he ended up being, what, 11 ahead on that or whatever. But the home runs, he only ended up one ahead of Josh Hamilton and two ahead of Edwin Encarnacion. Uh, that, I mean, that took us down to the last day, really. Um, just so... As a fan watching, what was what were those last couple of weeks like, Rogelio? That was that was crazy to watch, and and I to me it was as a fan of history of baseball just to see the a tiger being involved in something that Yastrzemski it was just Yastrzemski broke Tiger fans' hearts in '67. He literally carried Boston to that title, and it was down to Boston and Detroit that year. And so I thought that was kind of rather ironic that he also matched him in terms of home runs too. And that was, that was fun. It was just a lot of Tiger. The Tigers have always been known or the last, I mean, with Verlander at the time, everybody's been talking about the, the pitching and, and, but to have a guy, an individual stat like that, not since, you know, outside of Cecil Field there and you have Trammell's, you know, getting at least to me, getting hosed out of the 87 MVP, but I digress there wasn't a tiger that had captured the entire imagination of the country like that as an offensive player. We, well, we talk about Mark Fidrich, what have you, but historically mm -hmm. that was huge because it's just, he was among, you know, Mike Trout, these guys are, these guys are all great talents and just, mm -hmm. he's going to be one of something that has been done in 40 plus years. That was just every bat I watched and just able to, I remember when Fox Sports Detroit had that little tracker, the Triple Crown tracker, and doing all the stats and everything. That was a cool thing to see, too. For sure. Just to have anybody have a Triple Crown tracker that late in the season was definitely exciting, but obviously much more exciting around here. Um, so then let's flip to um, Cody. We'll start with you for this one. The 
the 3,000 hits and 500 home runs. I mean, you're around for the chases of these. You know, in Detroit history, we haven't had, I mean, K-Line got 3,000 hits. It was in the 70s. It was different. He hit it on the road, which doesn't necessarily matter in the but in the fact that we did they didn't televise every game back then it wasn't the same kind of situation um we didn't have these stat trackers you know up in the outfield where people were you know moving the numbers around and everything like that and we just haven't had that no one's hit 500 home runs for detroit before only k-line and cobb have gotten 3,000 hits i mean if there was a bigger deal we'd have more if it was a that's another digression though if that if 3,000 hits was established earlier. Sam Crawford would have it too, and, you know, a handful of other players. Um, maybe not a handful of other Detroiters, but, you know, that's – but that was so long ago anyway. You know, nobody remembers Cobb chasing 3,000. It was kind of an afterthought because there had only been a couple of players that had ever gotten that at that point. Um, and K-Lines, you know, he was – it was his quiet march that you just kind of felt was inevitable. But this was two milestones at the same time both in, you know, in pursuit. We've never had this in Detroit. Can you just kind of talk about what, once they put those, you know, those uh, uh, markers up or, you know, those uh, those trackers, like the physical trackers at the in the outfield that the, the, the fans were able to, you know, utilize. And it felt more real. It's never, we've never had that before. What was, what was that like, the energy when that first started? Well, yeah, certainly, you know, some of the, the cooler experiences of my career were witnessing a 3,000th hit and, and following a chase for 500. Um, I think Miguel certainly felt the the weight and pressure. I think uh, an underrated aspect of Miguel Cabrera, a guy who has a very keen understanding and appreciation for the history of the sport. Um, I mentioned earlier, you saw him turn more reflective toward the end, and I think it's because he... I uh, was well aware of the gravity of reaching those milestones and how rare it is to to uh, be in such company. The chases themselves, I, I think it was key for Miguel Cabrera's legacy in Detroit. You know, we've talked a lot about his public perception. Um, was he almost underappreciated? You know, when I started covering the team in 2019 and 2020, you heard a lot of, you know, this guy's washed. Why is he still in the lineup? And and he still heard some of that, but um, I think it led to a renewed appreciation when suddenly uh, it, it, it led to more reflection from fans. Oh, we've been able to watch one of the all-time greats for more than a decade. He's going to go into the Hall of Fame as a Tiger. There's going to be a statue of him. And suddenly, during some really lean years of baseball, when the Tigers were not in contention, you started hearing friends Hey, let's go to the game. Can we get a ticket? How much are tickets? You started seeing people pack the ballpark and want to be there uh, just to witness a small snippet of history. So, um, yeah, you know, you saw it again in this final weekend. There was this big celebration. It was, you know, the, the Tigers milked it for every dollar they could, but it was certainly really cool. Um, the, like I said, I think a renewed appreciation was the ultimate result of those chases. For sure. I remember I was one of those came across the state for him to get his 500th home run and he hit it five feet foul down the right field. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did not get to see that one that time, but it was that kind of excitement. It's a different, if it's, it's a different kind of excitement when something like that's going on. So, all right. So I want to get to the legacy now. And um, Jason, I'm going to start with you for this one. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, the numbers are obviously there. 306 career average, you know, 500 home runs, 3,000 hits, 600 doubles, 1,800 RBIs, 1,500 runs, four batting titles, two MVPs, triple crown, a partridge and a pear tree. Where do you see now that it's over? Where where is his place in Detroit? Where does he rank among Detroit uh, Detroit uh, Tigers? Not not dealing with other sports, but like where does he really rank among all time Tigers? Do you think? Uh in I, in terms of regard, it's you know this is a tough market to break through baseball wise, obviously because you're talking about a place where Ty Cobb was a star, and you know where where Alan Trammell will always have a special place. Al Kaline, obviously, you know Mr. Tiger. I I think he should be right up there. Um, I 
I don't know if he will, you know, partly because he started his career somewhere else. Um, you know, and maybe partly because of some of the demons he chased. But I think in terms of pure players and how they contributed, you know, it's I think he should be regarded as one of the greatest players this franchise has ever had. Um, I, I I think he should be, you know, in terms of ability wise, right up there with, with Cobb and Kaline and Hank Greenberg. So that'd be your uh, Mount Rushmore of the Tigers right there? Sort of right. Yeah. Yeah. I think in terms of the combination of pure hitting ability and power and the ability to impact games. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd put him up there. Okay. Rogelio. I would echo what Jason said. And I think as far as players in the in modern times, I, I think Miguel Cabrera, even Al Kaline gave him as one of the best right, right handed hitters he's ever seen. And I, I as far as great Tigers go, if we're going to put Mount Rushmore somewhere in the city of Detroit, as I will go one step further and is one of the greatest athletes that's ever played in any Detroit professional sports because the numbers he put up, and this is not – this is – the outliner is he did this during very – when pitching started getting better and, and velocities and the stats started coming, coming. When you start realizing what he's up against and, and some of these guys are no – I know pitching is not what we had Jim Cat on earlier, and he pitched from a different era, but still, Cabrera was able to do this. All, all the advanced science, all the advanced numbers, to me, by far, the, one of Detroit's, if not Michigan's, greatest athletes. What, however you want to say it from a regional standpoint. Okay, Cody? Yeah, you know, I'm looking at this right now. Cabrera actually ranks – uh, 10th in Tigers history in career war, obviously didn't play uh, a couple of his peak years as a Tiger. I mean, I, I think overall, I would rank him probably number two in Tigers history. I think Cobb, if you really look at it, is by far the greatest player to have ever played for the Tigers. Uh, probably a close second between Al Kaline and Miguel Cabrera. A lot of other people have worn this jersey, but I think Cabrera attained a level of dominance that uh, no one else except Cobb reached as a Tiger. I like that take. I mean, it's a, that's, that's going to be, a, I feel like that's going to be a debate for years now between our generation and our parents' generation who was better Cabrera or Kaline, because they both did so many things great, but also their best assets were a little different. And so it's, you can't really compare them in their totality head to head, which is great. That's what baseball is all about debates like this. Um, so all right, now let's uh, switch gears. Uh, same, same, same vein. Jason Beck. I mean, right-handed hitters of all time. I mean, we got, you know, we got Cabrera and Aaron and Mays as the only two play or the only three players, three thousand hits, five hundred home runs, and a three hundred career average. You got other, you know, great players: Jimmy Fox, DiMaggio, Pujols, Hornsby, Hannes Wagner, Frank Thomas, Mike Trout. I mean, who's obviously still going, but I mean. Uh, Alex Rodriguez, uh, there's different, uh, you know, different reasons I didn't maybe write his name down. But, I mean, that's, you, you're talking 10 guys or so. Um, right-handed hitters-wise, in the, especially in the modern era, where 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 do you place him? I, I, I think you have to put him up there, you know, w w with Mason Aaron. I, I think you do. Um, you know, in terms of the combination of power and overall hitting ability and the window in which he sustained both to become, you know, such a feared hitter during his peak years, I think puts him up there. Um, you know, just, and you wonder if you'll see that type of combination for such an extended stretch again. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I love that he and Pujols did it at the same time at the same position. Now I think uh, Cabrera's peak, was better than Pujols' peak, but Pujols was a better overall, you know, had a better overall maybe career uh, in terms of his fielding and his other things and his, you know, a little bit more longevity. But, uh, and that that also goes into debates. What what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? Because you could have that debate in Detroit with Trammell and Whitaker. Trammell had a much better peak, but when you look at their totalities of their career, 
Whitaker was more consistent and had better, you know, more hits, homers, runs, RBIs, everything in one fewer year, you know? So uh, it, it's just one of those thing. another thing about baseball there uh, that just uh, really exciting. Rogelio, what do you got him? Right-handed hitters. I look at the, I sent you guys, or I was sending, I was looking around, I do scouting reports and I'm always looking at that because I do stuff for with prospects and where he ranks around right-handed hitters, just this prospect report alone. This is 1998. He's 15 years old. And they had him at a future 70 as a, a power and hitting ability at 65. And, and even then, but just power poise that right there is the signs of a, a, a legend to come, if you will. And I, I, I know it sounds like I'm really kind of exaggerating that a little bit, but how it, it scouting is one of the hardest things to do. Right. And able to identify that, I, I think he is, to me, one of the best right-handed hitters I've seen in, in the last 30 years, just because of just his pure ability. But that scouting report, just when I when I discovered that, and, and the ability to see that, that those skill set was already there, that, that adds to his legend status. For sure. And I feel like, you know, growing up, I I watched Frank Thomas do things I didn't think right-handed hitters could do. He hit to he hit to right field. Uh, he hit uh, at least one home run in every game I ever saw him play live. Every regular season game, uh, which was a lot over the years. Um, and I, I've since joked with him about that um, about why uh, why I didn't ask him to get White Sox season tickets. And I said because I didn't want you to hit those home runs. <laughs> but, um, but he did that. But then when Cabrera came along, it was a different level. Like, yes, Frank Thomas could do all those things, hit for average, hit for power, get on base, you know, hit to right field. But he was good at it, but Cabrera made an art out of it, if that makes sense. Like, it was a – I never thought growing up when I was watching Griffey and Frank Thomas that there would be somebody that did those things better at the plate. I just – and and he did, and he did for a long time, which was which was crazy. So, all right, Cody, chime in here on the right-handed hitters bit. Yeah, the it, you know, it's hard to compare all-time greats. And like I said earlier, sometimes I wonder, in a different world, say Cabrera, a little bit healthier, takes a little better care of himself, would he be hands down the greatest right-handed hitter? Sometimes I wonder. Sometimes I think there's a chance. Right. I think regardless, he's, it, it, he's probably top five, and you can probably debate the order of that top five um Aaron Willie Mays who holds uh will include a rod um you know I'm voting for if I ever get a hall of fame vote I'm I'm voting for all the steroid guys those are the guys I uh, grew up watching but uh obviously there's an asterisk there you you can debate in uh the order of those guys I do think there's a tendency in Detroit to say Miguel was the best right-handed hitter of an era of the era uh, as you pointed out I think who holds the totality of his career a little bit better um, some other guys like a Frank Robinson certainly have a case, but, but I think Miguel is a, a sure thing. Top five for sure. And it's so hard to do. Yeah. Like you said, like, you know, just Rogers Hornsby and Jimmy Fox played in such a different time. Yeah. <laughs> like that's not, that's such a different time, even such a more different time than Frank Robinson, you know? Uh, so it's, I, and this best part of best part of base, baseball. I mean, we're not having, you know, those debates don't happen in the NFL. I mean, it's, it's Barry Sanders versus Jim Brown. And that's it. Like, there's not a, you know, for the best running back. And there's nobody before Jim Brown because the game wasn't the same. And it's, you know, you can, it, there's more finite things, but you don't have that in baseball, which I was one of my favorite things about it for sure. Um, Gary Gillette, you want to chime in on this uh, right handed hitters bit? Dan, I'd love to, but actually, I just got a message from Sabre HQ. They booked, triple booked the Zoom account from 3 30 to 4 and so they asked as a courtesy could we wrap up early so the la chapter can start their meeting and uh so i would be glad to defer my comments um to a wrap up of the panel and then uh we'll end the meeting because after the panel i just had general discussion about stuff that will come up this year and i can send that out by email but before i go i want i before we go i want to thank uh, Jason and uh, Cody and Rogelio. This was a really good panel. I I really enjoyed it, uh, even though I know all three of them, so I knew some of what they were going to say. 
They're just incredibly gracious and incredibly candid, which makes it even better. Yeah, thanks everybody. Very, very good discussions. And I love, uh, you know, I love the all time greats discussions. Those are always, that'll never, that'll never get old for me. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to have everybody's take. Everybody has a good take. Cabrera could be first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth on that list. And you know who's right? Everybody. Everybody's right. I love it. So, I mean, if you want to take two or three minutes to wrap up or give everyone a chance to make a final comment, then I'll uh, sign us off. Okay. Yeah, I'll give uh, I'll give everybody one quick. What's your your from your different perspectives, Cody? We'll start with you. What's your lasting memory of Cabrera going to be? Uh, you know, I think hit three thousand and the day or two before. Um, probably the most candid I ever saw him. He kind of held court with a group of reporters around his locker and and talked about um the chase for three thousand. He talked about what Al K line meant to him. He talked about kind of his son and, and the future of the game. It was definitely the most forthcoming I ever saw Miguel. And and I think that was two days later. Uh it was hit number three thousand. I think that was probably the moment uh despite all the the complexities that I've talked about, I think that was the moment I probably most appreciated just the opportunity to cover um, a, a first ballot Hall of Famer. All right, Jason. Uh, the the tiebreaker game in 09, as I already discussed, uh, the last day of the 2012 regular season where he clinched a triple crown, and uh, probably the last day of the 2016 season where they fell – just shy of the playoffs and you started to wonder if we were seeing the end of Pete Cabrera just because you got a sense you got a sense of the injuries that were piling up. Sure. All right, and Rogelio. It was a privilege that I got to see it as a fan and also as a writer. And that's something that is to me I don't take that for granted and I'm beyond grateful that I had the opportunity to to cover him the last two seasons and to be able to have the perspective of learning it from just being a a Latino uh, fan and just, and not just a family and baseball fan period, but just having somebody that with that kind of caliber in Detroit in a Tigers uniform, that was great to see. And, And it's just, it's, Honestly, like I, 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 I pinch myself sometimes with some of the opportunities I've had. So the, the Miguel covering Miguel Cabrera and rooting him on as a fan, I would say. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Um, Cody and Jason, especially thank you for joining us for this and Rogelio always good to ha- have you on board in a panel um, and get your insights. So this is uh, one of the, one of the better discussions we've had uh, in a long time. And I really appreciate everybody for, being a part of it and uh, and tuning in. Yeah, folks, and and I'm sorry we're going to have to end a little early. Uh, it would have been great to hang on and uh, chew the fat for another five or ten minutes, and I might have even had something important to say. Who knows? But um, watch for emails from me. We're going to have another joint AL Central chapter meeting uh, right around opening day. We're also <laughs> going to have Jason Benetti uh, appear at one of our meetings. It's not uh, scheduled yet, but hopefully right around opening day as well. And uh, any comments you have, you can email me or text me or call me. Uh, And thanks to everybody for showing up, especially thanks to our guests. So I'm going to end the Zoom so LA can get on board. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.